Part Four, Chapter Ten of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Ten. Has it ever happened to you? Asked Natasha of her brother when they were comfortably settled in the divan room. Has it ever happened to you that it seemed as though there were nothing, just nothing at all, left in the future for you? that all that was best was past, and that you were not so much bored as disgusted. Haven't I, indeed? Many a time when everything was going well, and all were gay, it would come into my head that it was all vanity and vexation of spirit, and that all of us would have to die. Once, at the regiment, I did not go out to promenade, though the band was playing, for everything had suddenly become so gloomy. Ugh! I know what you mean— I know, I know, interposed Natasha. When I was a tiny bit of a girl, it used to be that way with me. Do you remember I was punished once, on account of those plums, and you were all dancing, while I had to sit alone in the classroom and sobbed? I shall never forget how melancholy I felt, and how vexed with you all, and with myself. Oh, yes, vexed with you all, all of you. And the worst of it was, I was not to blame, said Natasha. Do you remember— I remember, replied Nikolai, and I remember that I went to you, and wanted to comfort you, and, do you know, I was ashamed to do it. We were terribly absurd. I had at that time a kind of a toy, like a mannequin, and I wanted to give it to you. Do you remember? And do you remember, asked Natasha, with a thoughtful smile, how, once, long, long time ago, when we were little tots, Uncle took us into the library, that was in the old house, and it was dark. And when we went in, suddenly there stood before us. A negro, said Nikolai, taking the word from her mouth and laughing merrily. Of course I remember it. And now I can't tell for the life of me that it was a negro, or whether we saw it in a dream, or whether it was something that we were told. He was gray, you remember, and had white teeth, and he stood and stared at us. Do you remember it, Sonya? asked Nikolai. "'Yes, I have a dim recollection of something about it,' timidly replied the young girl. "'I have asked both Papa and Mamma about that negro,' said Natasha. "'They declare that no negro was ever here. "'But you see, you remember about it.' "'Certainly I do, and now I recall his teeth very distinctly.' "'How strange! Just as though it were in a dream. I like it. "'And do you remember how we were rolling eggs in the music-room?' and suddenly two little old women appeared and began to whirl round on the carpet. That was so, wasn't it? Do you remember how fine it was? Yes, and do you remember how Papenka, in a blue shuba, used to fire off his musket from the doorsteps? Thus smiling with delight, they took turns in calling up, not the reminiscences of a gloomy old age, but the recollections of the poetic days of youth, impressions from the most distant past, dreams fused and confused with reality, and these happy recollections sometimes made them quietly laugh. Sonya, as usual, sat at a little distance from the other two, though their recollections were not confined to themselves alone. Sonya did not remember much of what the others did, and what came back to her failed to arouse in her that poetic feeling which they experienced. She simply rejoiced in their enjoyment, and tried to take part in it. She began to feel a special interest in these reminiscences, only when they came to speak of her first coming to their house. Sonya was telling how afraid she was of Nikolai, because he wore braid on his jacket, and her nurse told her that they were going to sew her up in braid. "'And I remember they told me that you were born under a cabbage,' said Natasha. "'And I remember also that I did not dare to disbelieve it, though I knew that it was a fib, and I felt so uncomfortable.' At this stage of the conversation a chambermaid thrust her head into the divan-room, at the rear door, and said in a whisper, "'Veronishna, they have brought the cock.' I don't want it, Polya, now. Tell them to carry it away again. While they were still engaged in talking, Dimmler came into the divan room and went to the harp that stood in one corner. As he took off the covering, the harp gave forth a discordant sound. Edward Karluitch, please play my favorite nocturne, that one by Monsieur Field, cried the old countess from the drawing room. Dimmler struck a chord and, turning to Natasha, Nikolai, and Sonya, said, Young people, how quiet you are sitting. "'Yes, we are talking philosophy,' said Natasha. Looking up for an instant, and then pursuing the conversation, 
It now turned upon dreams. Dimmler began to play. Natasha noiselessly went on her tiptoes to the table, took the candle, and carried it out. Then she came back and sat down quietly in her place. In the room, especially that part where the divan was on which they were sitting, it was dark, but through the lofty windows the silver light of the full moon fell across the floor. "'Do you know, I think,' said Natasha, drawing close to Nikolai and Sonya, when Dimmler had now finished his nocturne, and sat lightly thrumming the strings, apparently uncertain whether to cease or to play something else. "'I think that when you go back, remembering, and remembering, and remembering everything, you remember so far back that at last you remember what happened even before you were born. At least I do.' "'That is metempsychosis,' exclaimed Sonya, who always had been distinguished for her scholarship and her good memory. The Egyptians used to believe that our souls once inhabited the bodies of animals, and will go into animals again. "'Ah, but do you know, I don't believe that we were ever in animals,' remarked Natasha, in the same low voice, though the music had ceased. "'But I know for certain that we used to be angels in that other world, and, when we come here, we remember about it.' "'May I join you?' asked Dimmler, coming up noiselessly, and taking a seat near them. "'If we were angels, then why have we fallen lower?' suggested Nikolai. "'No, that can't be.' "'Who told you that you are lower than the angels? "'Because I know what I used to be,' objected Natasha, with conviction. "'You see, the soul is immortal. "'It must be, if I am going to live always, that I lived before, lived a whole eternity.' "'Yes, but it is hard for us to realize what eternity is, remarked Dimmler, who, when he had joined the group of young people, had worn a slightly scornful smile, but now spoke in as low and serious a tone as the rest. Why is it hard to realize eternity? demanded Natasha. After today comes tomorrow, and then the next day, and so on forever, and, in the same way, yesterday was, and the day before, and so on. Natasha, now it's your turn. "'Sing me something,' said the countess's voice. "'Why are you all sitting there, like conspirators?' "'Mamma, I don't feel like it,' said Natasha. But nevertheless she got up. Not one of them, not even Dimmler, who was no longer young, wanted to break off the conversation and leave the corner. But Natasha had arisen, and Nikolai took his place at the harpsichord. Natasha, as usual, going to the centre of the music-room, and choosing the place where her voice sounded best, began to sing her mother's favourite piece. She had said that she did not feel like singing, but it was long since she had sung as she sang that evening, and long before she sang so well again. Count Ilya Andreyitch listened to it from his library, where he was closeted with Matenka, and, like a schoolboy in haste to go out to play as soon as his lessons are done, he stumbled over his words as he gave his instructions to his overseer, and finally stopped speaking, while Matenka, also with ears attent, stood silently in front of the count. Nikolai did not take his eyes from his sister, and even breathed when she did. Sonya, as she listened, thought what a wide gulf there was between her and her friend, and how impossible it would be to find any one in the world so bewitchingly charming as her cousin. The old countess, with a smile of melancholy pleasure, and with tears in her eyes, sat occasionally shaking her head. She was thinking of Natasha, and of her own youthful days, and of that unnatural and terrible element that seemed to enter into this engagement of her daughter with Prince Andrei. Dimmler, taking his seat next to the Countess, and covering his eyes, listened. "'No, Countess,' said he, finally. "'This talent of hers is European. She has nothing to learn. Such smoothness, sympathetic quality, power. Ugh! Oh, how I tremble for her! How worried I am!' said the Countess, not realizing to whom she was speaking. Her maternal instinct told her that Natasha had more in her than ordinary girls, and that this would result in unhappiness for her. Natasha had not quite finished her singing, when fourteen-year-old Petya, all excitement, came running into the room with the news that some maskers had come. Natasha abruptly stopped. "'Durak! Idiot!' she cried to her brother, and, running to a chair, flung herself into it, and sobbed so that it was long before she could recover herself." "'It's nothing, Mamenka. Truly it's nothing. It was only Petya startled me,' said she, striving to smile, but her tears still flowed, and her throat was choked by her repressed sobs. The house-servants, who had dressed themselves up as bears, Turks, tavern-keepers, fine ladies, monsters, and ogres, 
bringing in with them the outside cold and hilarity at first shyly clustered together in the anteroom but gradually hiding one behind the other they ventured into the ballroom and at first timidly but afterwards with ever-increasing fervour and zeal began to perform songs dances and corvades and other christmas games the countess after she had recognised them and indulged in a hearty laugh at their antics retired to the drawing-room count ilya andreitch with a radiant smile took his seat in the ballroom with approving glances at the masqueraders meantime all the young folks had mysteriously disappeared within half an hour the other masqueraders in the ballroom were joined by an elderly barunya in farthingale and this was nikolai by a turkish woman and this was petya by a clown this was dimmler by hussar natasha and by a circassian youth sonya both the girls had dark eyebrows and moustaches contrived with the help of burnt cork after well-feigned surprise and pretended lack of recognition as well as praise from those who were not murmuring the young people decided that their costumes were too grand to be wasted and that it was incumbent upon them to go and exhibit them elsewhere nikolai who had a strong desire for a trioka ride the roads being in splendid condition proposed that they should take with them the ten house serfs who were disguised and that all should go and visit the little uncle no he is an old man you will merely disturb him expostulated the countess why you couldn't all get into his house if you must go somewhere then go to melyukov's melyukova was a widow who with a host of children of various ages and with tutors and governesses lived about four versts from the rostovs there ma chere a good idea cried the old count becoming greatly excited wait till i can get into a costume and i will go with you i tell you we will wake pesheta up but the countess was not at all inclined to let the old count go since for several days his leg had been troubling him it was therefore decided that it was not best for ilya andreitch to go but that if luisa ivanovna that is to say madame Schoss, would act as chaperone then the young ladies might also go to melyukova's sonya though generally very timid and shy now was more urgent than all the others in her entreaties to luisa ivanovna not to leave them in the lurch sonyuk's costume was the best of all her moustache and dark brows were extremely becoming to her all assured her that she was very handsome and she was keyed up to a state of energy and excitement quite out of her usual manner some inner voice told her now or never her fate was to be decided and now in her masculine garb she seemed like another person Luisa Ivanovna consented, and in less than half an hour four triokas, with jingling bells, on shaft arch and harness swept, creaking and crunching over the frosty snow, up to the front steps. Natasha was the first to catch the tone of Christmas festivity, and this jollity was perfectly infectious, growing more and more noisy, and reaching the highest pitch as they all came out into the frosty air, and was shouting and calling, and laughing and screaming took their places in the sledges two or three spans were unmatched the third trioka belonged to the old count with a racer of the orlov breed between the thills the fourth was nikolai's own private troika with a low shaggy black shaft horse nikolai in his old maid's costume over which he threw his hussar's riding cloak fastened with a belt took his place in the middle of his sledge and gathered up the reins it was so light that he could see the metal of the harness plates shining in the moonbeams and the horses eyes as they turned them anxiously toward the merry group gathered under the dark roof of the porte chaucheres in nikolai's sledge were packed natasha sonya madame Schoss, and two of the maid-servants in the old counts went dimmler with his wife and petya in the others the rest of the household serfs were disposed you lead the way zakhar cried nikolai to his father's coachman he wished to have the chance to beat him on the road the old count's trioka with dimmler and the other masqueraders creaked as though its runners were frozen to the snow and with the jingling of its deep-toned bell started forward the side horses twitched at their shafts and kicked up the sugar-like gleaming crystals of the snow nikolai followed zakhar behind them with a creaking and crunching came the others at first they went rather gingerly along the narrow driveway as they passed the park the shadows cast by the bare trees lay across the road and checkered the moonlight but as soon as they got beyond the park enclosure the snowy expanse gleaming like diamonds with a deep blue phosphorescence 
all drenched in moonlight and motionless opened out before them in every direction all at once the foremost sledge dipped into a cradle hole in exactly the same way the one behind it went down and came up again and then the next behind and then boldly breaking the iron-bound silence the sledges began to speed along the road one after the other there is a hair track ever so many of them rang natasha's voice through the frost-bound air how light it is nicholas said sonya's voice nikolai glanced round and bent over so as to get a closer look into her face the pretty face with an odd and entirely new expression caused by the black brows and the moustache glanced up at him from under the sables that used to be sonya said nikolai to himself he gave her a closer look and smiled what is the matter nicholas nothing said he and he again gave his attention to his horses having now reached the hard-trodden high road stretching away in the moonlight and polished smooth by numberless runners and all hacked up by the tracks of the horseshoe nails the horses of their own accord began to pull on the reins and increase their speed the off horse tossing his head galloped along twitching on his traces the shaft horse shook out into a trot laying back his ears as though asking shall we begin or is it too early as yet zakhar's troika already a considerable distance ahead the jingle of its deep toned bell growing more and more distant could be seen like a black patch against the whiteness of the snow shouts and laughter and the voices of the party in the distance could be plainly heard now then my darlings cried nikolai giving a firm rein with one hand and raising his hand with the knout and only by the increase of the wind that blew in their faces and by the straining of the side horses which kept springing and galloping faster and more furiously could it be told at what a pace the troika was flying nikolai glanced back with shouts and whistling with creaking of whips and encouraging words to the horses followed the other troika at a flying pace the back of the shaft horse rose and fell steadily under the curved duga but with no thought of breaking and ready to give more and ever more speed if it were required of him nikolai now overtook the first troika they glided down a little slope and came out upon a road wide enough for several teams to drive abreast stretching along the interval by the riverside where will this take us i wonder queried nikolai this must be the sloping intervale but no it is a place i don't recognize at all i never saw it before it is neither the sloping intervale nor the dyonkin hill god only knows where we are it is certainly some new and enchanted place well what difference does it make to us and shouting at his horses he began to gain on the first troika zakhar held his team to their work and turned round his face white with frost even to the eyebrows nikolai gave his horses rein zakhar reached out his arms clicked his tongue and also gave his free rein now steady there baron cried he still swifter flew the two troikas side by side and swiftly the legs of the horses interwove as onward they sped nikolai began gradually to forge ahead zakhar not changing the position of his outstretched arms kept the hand that held the reins a little higher you can't come it baron he cried to nikolai nikolai urged all three of his horses to gallop and sped past zakhar the horses kicked the fine dry snow into the faces of the party the bells jingled together as they flew on side by side and the swiftly moving legs of the horses mingled together while the shadows crossed and interlaced upon the snow the runners whizzed along the road and the shouts and cries of the women were heard in each of the sledges once more reining in his horses nikolai glanced around him everywhere was the same magical expanse flooded deep with the moonbeams and with millions of stars scattered over it zakhar is shouting turn to the left but why to the left queried nikolai aren't we going to the melyukovs is this the way to melyukovna god knows where we are going and god knows what is going to become of us and it is very strange and very pleasant whatever becomes of us he looked down into the sledge oh see there his moustache and eyelashes are all white said one of the handsome young strangers with delicate moustaches and eyebrows who sat in the sledge that i think must have been natasha said nikolai to himself and the other is madame Schoss. and perhaps i am wrong but that circassian with the moustache i never saw before but i love her all the same you aren't cold are you he asked 
They gave no other answer than a merry laugh. Dimmler was shouting something from the hindmost sledge. It was probably funny, but he could not make out what it was. "'Yes, yes,' replied other voices, with a burst of laughter. "'And now here is a sort of enchanted forest, with black shadows interlacing, and the gleams of diamonds, and something like an enfilade of marble steps, and there are the silver roofs of an enchanted castle, and the piercing yells of wild beasts. But supposing after all it were, Milyukovka, then it would be still more wonderful that we should have gone, God knows how, and still have come out at Milyukovka said Nikolai to himself. In point of fact it was Melyukovka, and maids and lackeys began to appear on the doorsteps of the entrance with torches and happy faces. "'Who is it?' asked someone from the front door. "'Masqueraders from the Counts. I can tell by the horses,' replied various voices. End of chapter 10「Part Four, Chapter Eleven of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Eleven. Pelagaya Danilovna Milyukova, a very stout and energetic woman in spectacles and wearing a loose-fitting capote, was sitting in the drawing room, surrounded by her daughters, whom she was doing her best to entertain. They were quietly moulding wax and looking at the shadows cast by retreating figures when the steps and voices of the visitors began to echo through the anteroom. Hussars, high-born ladies, witches, clowns, bears, coughing and wiping their frost-bound faces, came into the ballroom, where the candelabras were hastily lighted. The clown, that is, Dimmler, with the barinha, that is, Nikolai, opened the dance. Surrounded by gleefully shouting children, the masqueraders, hiding their faces and disguising their voices, made low bows before the mistress of the mansion, and then scattered through the room. "'Ah! Oh, it is impossible to tell! Ah! that's Natasha! Just see whom she looks like! Truly she reminds me of someone! And there's Edward Karluitch! How elegant! I shouldn't have known you! Ah! Oh, how elegantly he dances! Ah! Oh, saints preserve us! And who is that Circassian? Indeed, it reminds me of Sonyushka. And who is that? Well, well, this is a kindness. Move out the tables, Nikita, Vanya, and we have been sitting here so solemnly. Ha, ha, ha! What a hussar! What a hussar! Just like a boy, and what legs! I can't look at you. Such were the remarks on every side. Natasha, who was a great favorite with the young Melyukovs, disappeared with them into some distant room, where a burnt cork and dressing gowns and various articles of masculine attire were immediately in requisition, and these were snatched from the lackey who brought them, through the half-open door, by girlish arms all bare. Within ten minutes all the young people of the Melyukov family came down and rejoined the masqueraders. Pelagea Danilovna, who had seen that a sufficient place was cleared for her guests, and regalement prepared for the gentlefolk as well as the serfs, went round among the maskers with her spectacles on her nose, and a set smile, looking close into the faces of all, and not recognizing a single one. She neither recognized the Rostovs nor Dimmler, nor could she even distinguish her own daughters, or the masculine dressing-gowns and uniforms which they had put on. "'And who is that one?' she asked of the Gouvernatka, and looking straight into the face of her daughter, who represented a Kassan Tatar. I think it must be one of the Rostovs. Well, and you, Mr. Hussar, what regiment do you serve in? she asked of Natasha. Give that Turk, yes, that Turk, some fruit cake, said she to the butler, who was serving the refreshments. It is not forbidden by their laws. Sometimes, looking at the strange but absurd pass performed by the dancers, who gave themselves up completely to the ideas that they were mumming, that no one would recognize them, and therefore felt no mock of modesty. Pelagea Danilovna would hide her face in her handkerchief, and her whole fat body would shake with the good-natured and uncontrollable laughter of old age. After they had performed the Plyaska, various korvads, and other Russian national dances, Pelagea Danilovna had all the serfs and the others together form into a great circle. A ring, a rope, and a rouble were brought, and they began to play various games. By the end of an hour the costumes began to show signs of wear and tear. The charcoal moustaches and eyebrows began to disappear from the sweaty, heated, jolly faces. Pelagaya Danilovna began to recognize the masqueraders, and congratulate them on the skill with which they had made up their costumes, 
and tell them how very becoming they were to the young ladies, and she thanked them all for having entertained her so well. The guests were invited into the drawing-room, and refreshments were provided in the ballroom for the serfs. "'No, but what a terrible thing to read your fortune in a bath!' exclaimed an old maid, who lived with the Malyukovs. "'Why so?' asked the oldest daughter of the family. They were now sitting down at supper. "'No, don't think of doing such a thing. It requires so much courage.' "'I would as just leaf, said Sonya. "'Tell us what happened to that young lady,' asked the second Malikova girl. "'Well, this was the way of it. "'A certain Varishna, said the old maid, "'took a cock, two plates, knives and forks, as the way is, "'and went and sat down. "'She sat there, and sat there, "'and suddenly she hears someone coming. "'A sledge drives up, with harness bells jingling. "'She listens. "'Someone is coming. "'Someone comes in.' absolutely in human form just like an officer and sits down with her where the second plate is set oh oh screamed natasha rolling her eyes in horror and how was it how did he speak to her yes just like a man everything was just as it should have been and he began to talk with her and all she needed to do was to keep him talking till the cock crowed but she got frightened as soon as she got frightened and hid her face in her hands then he clasped her in his arms. Luckily just then some maids came running in. "'Now, what is the good of frightening them so?' protested Pelagaya Danilovna. "'Mamasha, you yourself have had your fortune told,' exclaimed one of the daughters. "'How is it fortunes are told in a granary?' asked Sonya. "'Well, this is the way of it. You go into the granary and listen. It depends on what you hear. If there is any knocking or tapping, it is a bad sign.' but if the wheat drops, then it's for good, and it will come out all right. Mama, tell us what happened to you when you went to the granary. Pelagia Danilovna smiled. Oh, what's the use? And I have forgotten, said she. Besides, you wouldn't go, would you? Yes, I would go, too. Pelagia Danilovna, do let me. I certainly will go, said Sonya. Very well, then, if you are not afraid. Louisa Ivanovna, can I? asked Sonya of Madame Schoss. While they were playing the games with the ring, the rouble, and the rope, and now, while they were talking, Nikolai had not left Sonya's side, and looked at her from wholly new eyes. It seemed to him that this evening, thanks to that charcoal moustache, he, for the first time, knew her as she really was. In reality, Sonya, that evening, was merrier, livelier, and prettier than Nikolai had ever seen her before. Why, what a girl she is! and what an idiot I have been, he said to himself, as he gazed into her gleaming eyes, and saw her radiantly happy and enthusiastic smile dimpling her cheeks under her moustache, and that look which he had never seen before. I am not afraid of anything, said Sonya. Can I start now? She got up. She was told where the granary was, and how she must stand and listen, and make no noise. The servant brought her shuba. She flung it over her head, and gave a glance at Nikolai. "'How charming that girl is,' he said to himself. "'And what have I been thinking about all this time?' Sonya stepped out into the corridor on her way to the granary. Nikolai, making the excuse that he was too warm, hurried to the front steps. It was a fact. The crowd made the air in the rooms close. Out of doors it was as cold and still as ever. The moon was shining, except that it was brighter than before.' The brightness was so intense, and there were so many gleaming stars in the snow, that those on high were quite effaced, and one had no desire to look for them there. The sky was almost black and spoke of gloom. The terrestrial sky was white and gay. "'What an idiot I have been! What an idiot! Why have I waited so long?' mused Nikolai, and he sprang down the steps and turned to the corner of the house by the footpath that led back to the rear entrance. He knew that Sonya would come that way. Halfway along the path stood a great woodpile covered with snow and casting deep shadows. Across it and beyond it fell the shadows of the lindens, bare and old, weaving patterns on the snow and the path. The footpath led to the granary. The timber walls of the granary and its roofs, covered with snow, shone in the moonlight, like a palace made of precious stone. One of the park trees crackled in the frost and then everything became absolutely still again. It seemed to Nikolai as if his lungs breathed in not common air, but the elixir of eternal youth and joy. 
Feet were heard stamping on the steps of the servant's entrance. Someone was scraping the snow away from the lower step on which it had drifted, and then the voice of an old maid said, "'Straight ahead, straight ahead, right along this path, Baronishna. Only you must not look round.' "'I am not afraid,' replied Sonya's voice, and then toward Nikolai came Sonya's dainty feet, sliding and squeaking in her thin slippers. Sonya came along, all muffled up in her shuba, and it was not till she was within two paces of him that she saw him. It seemed to her also that he was different from what she had ever known him before, and that he had nothing of what always made her a bit afraid of him. He was in his feminine costume, with clustering locks, and wearing a blissful smile such as Sonya had never seen before. Sonya swiftly hurried to him. "'She's entirely different. Not at all the same,' thought Nikolai, as he looked into her face, all kindled by the moonlight. He put his arms under her shuba, which encircled her head, strained her to his heart, and kissed her lips, which still showed traces of the moustache, and had a faint odour of burnt cork. Sonya returned his kiss full on the lips, and putting up her slender hands laid them on both sides of his face. Sonya! Nicholas! That was all they said. They ran to the granary, and then they went back into the house by the doors through which they had come. End of chapter 11Part 4, Chapter 12 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 12 When they drove home from Pelagea de Lovna's, Natasha, who had seen and observed everything, made a redistribution of forces, so that Luisa Ivanovna and Dimmler went in the sledge with her, while Sonya and Nikolai and some of the maids drove together. Nikolai, feeling now no anxiety to take the lead, drove deliberately along the homeward road, and as he kept turning to look at Sonya, with the weird moonlight falling on her, he tried to discover in that all-transforming light the Sonya of the past from the Sonya of the moment, with her charcoal-penciled brows and moustache, the Sonya from whom he was determined never to be parted. As he looked at her, and remembered what she was, and what she had been, as he recalled that odour of the burnt cork, mingling so strangely in his consciousness of her kiss, and as he gazed at the ground swiftly gliding by, and at the glittering sky, he felt that he was once more in the realm of enchantment. "'Sonya, art thou comfortable?' he would occasionally ask. "'Yes,' would be Sonya's answer. "'And art thou?' When they were halfway home, Nikolai told the coachman to hold the horses, and he ran back for a moment to Natasha's sledge, and leaned over the side. "'Natasha!' he whispered, in French. "'Do you know, I have made up my mind in regard to Sonya?' "'Have you told her yet?' asked Natasha, becoming all radiant with delight. "'Oh, how strange that moustache and those eyebrows make you look, Natasha! Are you glad?' "'Oh, I am so glad, so glad. I was beginning to grow angry with you. I have not told you so, but you haven't been treating her fairly. She is such a true-hearted girl, Nicholas. How glad I am!' I am often naughty, but I have reproached myself for being selfish in my happiness and not sharing it with Sonya, pursued Natasha. But now I am so glad. But you must go back to her. No, wait a moment. Fee, how absurd you do look, exclaimed Nikolai, still gazing at her, and in his sister also discovering something new and unusual and bewitchingly lovely, which he had never before noticed in her. Natasha, it's like enchantment, isn't it? "'Yes,' replied she, "'you have done nobly.' "'If ever I had seen her like this before,' thought Nikolai, "'I should long ago have asked her advice, "'and what is more should have followed it, "'and all would have been well. "'So you are glad, and I have done right, have I?' "'Oh, yes, perfectly right. "'It was only a little while ago "'that I got vexed with Mamasha about this. "'Mama said that she was trying to catch you. "'How could she say such a thing? "'I almost quarrelled with Mamma and I will never allow anyone to say anything mean about her, because she is goodness itself. All right, then, is it? exclaimed Nikolai, giving another searching look at the expression of his sister's face, so as to be sure that she was in earnest, and then, with creaking boots, he jumped down from the runner, and ran to overtake his own sledge. And there still sat the same radiantly happy little Circassian, with moustache and gleaming eyes, under her sable hood, and this Circassian was Sonya, 
and this Sonia was assuredly to be his happy and loving wife in the days to come. After they had reached home, and had told the countess how they had spent the time with the Melyukovs, the young girls went to their room. Without wiping off their burnt cork moustaches, they undressed, and sat together for a long time, talking about their happiness. They had much to say about their future married lives, and what friends their husbands would be, and how happy they should be. On Natasha's table stood dressing glasses, placed there early that evening by her maid, Nunyasha. But when will all this be? Never, I fear me. It would be too great happiness to come true, said Natasha, as she got up and went over to the mirrors. Sit down, Natasha. Maybe you will see him, said Sonya. Natasha lighted the candles and sat down. I see someone with a moustache, exclaimed Natasha, catching sight of her own face. You must not turn it into ridicule, Baryshnya, said Dunyasha. Natasha, with the help of Sonya and her maid, got into the proper position before the glass. Her face assumed a serious expression, and she remained silent. Long she sat there, looking at the row of waning candles in the mirror, wondering, as she remembered the heroines of stories she had heard, whether this mysterious twelfth night she should see her coffin, or whether she should see him, Prince Andre, in the background of the dark and confused square of glass. But, as she was not ready to mistake the smallest spot or stain on the glass for the form of a coffin, or of a man, she saw nothing. Her eyes began to grow heavy, and she got up and left the mirror. "'How is it other people see things, and I never see anything?' she asked. "'Now you sit down, Sonya. Today, of course, you must look for yourself. But look for me, too,' said she. "'I have such terrible presentiments tonight.' Sonya sat down in front of the mirrors, arranged herself in the right position, and began to look. "'Now, Sofya Alexandrovna will surely see something.' whispered Dunyasha, but you are always making fun. Sonya overheard this, and heard Natasha reply, Yes, I know she will see something. She did last year, you remember. For three minutes all sat in silence. Of course she will, whispered Natasha, but she did not finish her sentence. Suddenly Sonya pushed the mirror back and covered her eyes with her hand. Ach, Natasha, she cried. Did you see something? Did you? What did you see? demanded Natasha taking the mirror from her. Sonya had seen nothing. Her eyes were simply beginning to grow heavy, and she was just on the point of getting up when she heard Natasha beginning to say, of course she will. She had no intention of deceiving either Dunyasha or Natasha, but it was stupid sitting there. She herself did not know how or why it was that the cry had escaped from her when she covered her eyes with her hand. Did you see him? demanded Natasha, seizing her by the arm. Yes, Wait, I saw him, said Sonya, led by some unaccountable impulse, but not knowing which Natasha meant by him, Nikolai or Andre. But why should I not tell what I saw? Others have seen such things, and who can prove that I did or didn't see something, was the thought that flashed through Sonya's mind. Yes, I saw him, said she. How was it? Was he sitting or standing? How was it? Now, I saw... At first I could not see anything, then suddenly I got a glimpse of him, and he was lying down. "'Andre, lying down? Is he ill?' demanded Natasha, gazing at her friend with horror-stricken eyes. "'No. On the contrary, his face was cheerful, and he turned toward me.' At that instant it began to seem to her that she had seen what she was telling. "'Well, and then what, Sonya?' "'Then I did not see anything more, something blue and red.' Sonya. When will he come back? When shall I see him? My God, how I tremble for him and for myself, and everything fills me with alarm, cried Natasha, and, paying no heed to the words of comfort spoken by Sonya, she got into bed, and long after the candles were put out, she lay there motionless, with wide open eyes, gazing at the frosty moonbeams flooding the icy window panes. End of chapter 12 Part Four, Chapter Thirteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Thirteen. Shortly after Twelfth Night, Nikolai confessed to his mother his love for Sonya and announced his firm determination to make her his wife. The Countess, 
who had long before that remarked what was going on between the two young people and who had been expecting this announcement listened in silence to his words and then coldly informed him that he might marry any one he pleased but that neither she nor his father would countenance such a marriage for the first time nikolai felt conscious that his mother was offended with him that notwithstanding all her love for him she would not yield to him in this matter with icy coldness and without looking at her son she sent for her husband and when he came she tried in nikolai's presence to tell him in a few chilling words of what her son proposed to do but she had not the necessary self-control tears of vexation sprang to her eyes and she was compelled to leave the room the old count tried feebly to reason with nikolai and begged him to give up his intention nikolai replied that he could not go back on his word and the father sighing and evidently all upset in his mind hastily put an end to the conference and went to the countess in all his encounters with his son the count always had the consciousness of his own blameworthiness towards him in regard to the squandering of his fortune and accordingly he could not show his anger against his son for refusing to wed a rich wife and for choosing penniless sonya in all this affair he remembered with the keener sorrow that if only his estates had not been so ruined it would be impossible for nikolai to find a better wife and that the only persons responsible for the wasting of this estate were himself and his matenka and their incorrigible habits the father and mother had nothing more to say to nikolai in regard to this but a few days later the countess summoned sonya and with a bitterness which no one in the world would have expected of her she reproached her niece with having decoyed her son and accused her of the blackest ingratitude sonya in silence and with downcast eyes listened to the countess's bitter words and was at a loss to know what was required of her she was ready for any sacrifice for all of them in return for their benefits the thought of self-sacrifice was ever a delight to her but in this affair she could not comprehend what she was required to sacrifice or for what purpose she could not help loving the countess and all the rostof family nor could she help loving nikolai or knowing that his happiness depended on her love for him she therefore stood silent and sad and had nothing to reply it seemed to nikolai that he could not longer endure this state of things and he went to his mother to have a final explanation nikolai first besought his mother to be reconciled to him and sonya and consent to their marriage then he threatened her that if they persecuted sonya he would instantly marry her clandestinely the countess with a coldness her son had never experienced before replied that he was of age that prince andrei was going to marry without his father's sanction and that he might do the same but that she would never receive this intrigantka as her daughter angry at her use of the term intrigantka nikolai raised his voice and told his mother that he had never thought that she would oblige him to sacrifice his noblest feelings and that if this were so then he would never but he did not finish uttering this rash vow which judging by the expression of his face his mother awaited with horror and which might have for ever raised a cruel barrier between them he did not utter it because natasha with a pale and solemn face came into the room she had been listening at the door nikolinka you do not know what you are saying hush hush i tell you hush she almost screamed so as to drown his words mamma darling there's no reason in this at all dushenka moya dear heart said she turning still paler and going to her mother who felt that she was on the very edge of an abyss and looked with horror at her son and yet by reason of her stubbornness and the impulse of the quarrel she would not and could not give in nikolinka i beg of you go away go and you sweetheart mamma listen she entreated turning again to her mother her words were incoherent but they brought about the wished-for result the countess deeply flushed buried her face in her daughter's bosom and nikolai got up and clasping his head between his hands rushed out of the room natasha acted the part of peacemaker so well that nikolai received a promise from his mother that sonya should not be annoyed and he himself swore that he would never do anything without the knowledge of his parents with the firm intention of retiring from the service as soon as he could wind up his connection with his regiment and return and marry sonya nikolai melancholy and grave still under strained relations with his parents but as it seemed to him passionately in love rejoined his regiment early in january 
after nikolai's departure it became sadder than ever in the house of the rostovs the countess owing to her mental tribulations was taken seriously ill sonya was depressed both on account of her separation from nikolai and still more on account of the unfriendly manner in which the countess in spite of herself treated her the count was more than ever occupied by the wretched state of his pecuniary affairs which demanded of him the most heroic measures it was absolutely necessary to dispose of their mansion in moscow and their podmoskovniana estate and in order to effectuate this sale it was essential to go to moscow but the state of the countess's health caused him to postpone his departure from day to day natasha who had easily and even cheerfully borne the first weeks of separation from her lover now every day grew more nervous and impatient the thought that she was wasting the best time of her life when she might so much better have been employing it in loving sacrifice for him constantly tormented her his letters generally merely served to annoy her it revolted her to think that when her life was nothing but a constant thought about him he was living in the great world of action seeing new places and new people who were full of interest to him the more fascinating his letters were the more they annoyed her her letters to him gave her no consolation they were nothing but tedious and hypocritical exercises she was not able to write freely because she could not realize the possibility of correctly expressing in a letter even the thousandth part of what she was accustomed to express with her voice her smile and her glance she wrote him perfunctory and monotonous letters the stupidity of which she herself acknowledged while her mother corrected in the rough draft the mistakes in spelling which she made the countess's health was still feeble but it was now no longer possible to put off the return to moscow it was necessary to arrange for the marriage settlement it was necessary to sell the mansion and moreover prince andrei was now expected in moscow where his father prince nikolai andreitch was spending the winter indeed natasha was certain that he had arrived already the countess remained in the country but the count taking sonya and natasha with him went to moscow toward the end of january end of chapter thirteen and this is the end of part four of volume two volume two part five chapter one of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne part five chapter one pierre after the engagement of prince andrei and natasha suddenly without any apparent reason began to find it impossible to pursue his former mode of life firmly as he was convinced of the truths revealed by the benefactor delightful as had been the first period of enthusiasm for the inward labor of self-improvement to which he had given himself up with such zeal all the charm of this former existence suddenly vanished after the betrothal of his friends and after the death of iosif alexievitch intelligence of which he received about the same time nothing but the empty skeleton of life remained to him his mansion with that brilliant wife of his who was still enjoying the favors of an influential personage his acquaintance with all petersburg and his duties at court with all their tedious formalities all this life of his suddenly began to fill pierre with unexpected loathing he ceased to write in his diary he shunned the society of the brethren he began once more to frequent the club and to drink heavily he became intimate with the gay young bachelor set and his behaviour became such that the countess elena vasilievna found it necessary to give him a stern admonition pierre felt that she was right and in order not to compromise her he decided to go to moscow in moscow as soon as he set foot in his enormous house with the dried up and withered princesses and the swarm of menials as soon as he went out into town and saw the iverskaya chapel with its innumerable tapers burning before the golden shrines and the square of the kremlin with its sheet of untrodden snow the izvoschek's and the hovels of the Svitsev Vrazek, saw old muscovites who with never a desire or a quickening of the blood lived out their days the muscovite dances the muscovite ballrooms the muscovite english club he felt himself at home in a refuge of quiet life in moscow gave him the sensation of comfort and warmth and coziness that one has in an old and dirty dressing-gown pierre was welcomed by all moscow society young and old as a long-expected guest 
whose place was always ready for him and never given to another. In the eyes of Moscow society, Pierre was most kindly, good-natured, intelligent, and benevolent, though eccentric, absent-minded, but cordial, a thoroughgoing Russian baron, of the old stamp. His purse was always empty, because it was opened to all. Benefits, wretched pictures, statuary, benevolent societies, gypsies, schools, subscription dinners, drinking bouts, the masons, churches, books. No one and nothing ever met with a refusal from him. And if it had not been for two friends of his, who had borrowed large sums of him and now took him under their guardianship, he would have had absolutely nothing left. At the club, no dinner or reception was complete without him. As soon as he took his place on the ottoman, after a couple bottles of Margu, the members would gather round him and vie with each other in all sorts of gossip, discussions, and clever stories. If discussions degenerated into quarrels, he would restore peace by his kindly smile alone, or by a clever jest. The Masonic meetings were tedious and dull if he were absent. Often after dining with his bachelor friends, he would yield with a genial and weakly smile to their entreaties and go with them where they went, and help the hilarious young fellows wake the echoes with their wild, enthusiastic shouts. At the balls he would never refuse to dance if partners were scarce. Young matrons and young girls liked him because he was attentive, especially after dinner, to all alike, without making invidious distinctions. It was a common saying of him, Il est charmant. Il n'est pas de sex. Pierre had become simply a retired court chamberlain, good-naturedly vegetating in Moscow, like so many hundreds of others. How horror-struck he would have been if, seven years before, when he was just back from abroad, someone had told him that it was idle for him to seek out or invent a career. That the ruts in which he would move were long ago made for him, determined before the foundation of the world, and that, in spite of all his struggles, he should be what every one in his position was doomed to be. He would not have been able to believe this. Had he not, with all his heart, wished at one time that a republic should be established in Russia, then that he might be a Napoleon, then a philosopher, then a general, the conqueror of Napoleon, had he not seen the possibility, and wished to take part in the mighty task of regenerating depraved humanity and of bringing himself to the highest degree of improvement, had he not established schools and infirmaries, and emancipated his peasantry. But instead of what he had dreamed, lo, here he was the rich husband of an unfaithful wife, a court chamberlain retired, a gourmand and wine-bibber, and easily inclined to criticize the government, a member of the English club, and a flattered habitué of Moscow society. It was long before he could reconcile himself to the thought that he himself was a court chamberlain living in Moscow, the very type of which he should have so deeply despised seven years before. Sometimes he comforted himself with the thought that this mode of life was only temporary, but then he would be terrified by another thought of how many people, just like himself, with all their hair and their teeth still good, had entered temporarily into this mode of life, and into this club, and were now passing from it, bald and toothless. In moments of pride, when he thought over his position, it seemed to him that he was of an entirely different nature, distinct from these retired chamberlains, whom he used to despise, that they were insipid and stupid, contented and satisfied with their position. While I, on the contrary, am utterly dissatisfied, my sole desire is to do something for humanity, he would say to himself, in such moments of pride. But perhaps all these colleagues of mine are just like myself, and have been struggling and seeking to find some new and original path through life, and, like myself, have, by sheer force of circumstances, by the conditions of society and birth, that elemental force against which man is powerless, been brought into the same condition as myself. This he would say to himself in moments of humility, and, after he had lived in Moscow for some time, he ceased to despise his colleagues, the retired courtiers, and began to like them, and to esteem them, and to pity them, as he did himself. Pierre no longer suffered, as formerly, from moments of despair, hypochondria, and disgust of life. But the same disease, which formerly had been made manifest by occasional attacks, had struck inward, and not for a moment ceased its insidious working. For what end? Why? 
For what purpose were we created in the world, he would ask himself, in perplexity many times every day, in spite of himself, beginning to reason out some explanation of life. But as he knew by experience that such questions as these must remain unanswered, he would strive in all haste to put them out of his mind, taking up a book, or going over to the club, or calling on Apollo Nikolaevich to talk over the gossip of the town. Elena Vysilyevna, whom no one ever cared for except for her body's sake, and who was one of the stupidest women in the world, said Pierre to himself, makes people believe that she is a woman of superior wit and refinement, and they bow down before her. Napoleon Bonaparte was despised by everyone until he became great, but since he has become a miserable comedian. The Emperor Franz is trying to make him take his daughter illegally for his wife. The Spaniards, through the Roman Catholic clergy, offered up prayers of thanksgiving to God for granting them a victory over the French on the 26th of June, while the French, through the medium of the same Catholic priesthood, offer up thanksgivings to the same God for having beaten the Spaniards on the 26th of June. My brethren, the Masons, solemnly swear that they will be ready to sacrifice all they possess for their neighbor, but, when the box is passed around, they do not contribute a single rouble for the poor." and the Astria Lodge intrigues against the manna-seekers, and they toil and moil for the sake of getting a genuine Scotch carpet and charter, though the meaning of it is not known even by the one who copies it off, and it is necessary to no one. All of us profess the Christian law of forgiveness of injuries, and of love for our neighbor, a law in obedience to which we have erected here in Moscow eighty score churches, while yesterday a deserter was flogged with a knout, and the priest, the servant of this same law of love and forgiveness, presented the crucifix for the soldier to kiss before he received his punishment. Thus mused Pierre, and this whole universal falsehood, which everybody acknowledges, amazed him every time he thought of it, just as though he were not used to it, just as though it were some new thing. I understand this falsehood and confusion, he thought, but how can I convince them of what I understand? I have made the experiment, and have always found that they, in the depths of their hearts, understand it just as I do, but they strive not to see it. Of course it must be so. But for me, what ought I to do? Pierre asked himself. He was undergoing the unhappy experience of many people, especially Russians, who have not only the faculty of seeing and realizing the possibility of goodness and right, but of seeing too clearly the falsity and deception of life to feel able to take any serious part in it. Every department of activity was, in his eyes, complicated with falsehood and deception. Whatever he had tried to be, whatever he had tried to accomplish, he always found himself jostled by this knavery and falsehood, with his path of activity completely blocked. But, meantime, it was necessary for him to live, necessary for him to find occupation. It was too terrible for him to be under the weight of these unsolvable problems of life, and so he gave himself up to the first temptation in order to forget them. He frequented the society of all sorts and conditions of men. He drank deeply. He purchased paintings. He built houses. And chief of all, he read. He read and read everything that came into his hands. And he was such an omnivorous reader that even when, on his return home, his valet came in to undress him, he continued his reading, and after reading till he was tired, he would fall asleep, and the next morning he would go to the club or call on acquaintances and talk gossip, and from there go to some wanton rout where wine and women served to occupy his mind, and thus around the circle again, from spree to reading, and then his idle gossip and wine. Strong drink was becoming for him constantly a greater and greater physical and even moral necessity. Although the doctors warned him that wine was dangerous to him, on account of his corpulency, he still continued to drink heavily. He felt perfectly happy only when, without knowing or caring how, he had poured down his capacious throat several glasses of wine, and begun to experience the pleasant warmth spreading through his frame, and good will toward all the human race and a mental readiness superficially to touch upon any question without pretending to penetrate deeply into its inner nature. Only after he had drunk a bottle or two of wine would he vaguely feel that this complicated, terrible coil of life, which had formerly appalled him, was now not so appalling as it had seemed. With a roaring in his ears, as he idly chatted or listened to stories, or read his books after dinner or supper, 
he saw this tangle of doubts constantly facing him on every side but it was only under the influence of wine that he could say to himself this is nothing i will put it away for the present for i have an explanation already but now is no time i will think it all out by and by this by and by never came when his stomach was empty the next morning all the former questions arose just as unsolvable and terrible and pierre hastened to seize his book and was delighted when any one came to call upon him sometimes pierre remembered what he had heard of soldiers at war that when they are lying idle under fire they eagerly strive to invent some diversion so as the more easily to forget the threatening danger and it seemed to pierre that all men were similar soldiers distracting themselves from life some by ambition others by cards others by codifying laws others by women play horses some by politics others by sport by wine by statecraft there is nothing insignificant there is nothing of great importance all is the same in the end only how can i save myself from it thought pierre only by not seeing it this terrible it end of chapter one Part five, chapter two of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter two. Early in the winter, Prince Nikolai Andreyitch Bolkonsky and his daughter took up their residence in Moscow. The fame of his past life, the keenness of his intellect, and his bold originality immediately caused him to be regarded by the Muscovites with special admiration and respect, and as the popular enthusiasm for the Emperor Alexander's management of affairs had notoriously cooled off, and given place to an anti-French and nationalistic tendency, now all the vogue in Moscow, he had become the centre of the opposition to the government. The prince had aged very considerably during the year past. He now began to manifest some of the acute symptoms of old age, unexpected naps, forgetfulness of recent events, and vivid remembrance of those long past, and the childish vanity with which he accepted the role of chief of the Muscovite opposition. Nevertheless, when the old prince came down to evening tea, in his fur shubka and powdered wig, and at anyone's instigation began to tell his pithy anecdotes about the days gone by, or deliver his still pithier and harsher judgments upon the present, he inspired in all his guests a single feeling of sincere respect. In the eyes of visitors, the old-fashioned house, with its huge pier-glasses, its anti-revolutionary furniture, its powdered lackeys, presided over by this severe and intelligent old man of a past generation, with his gentle daughter and the pretty Frenchwoman, who treated him with such deference, presented an impressive but agreeable spectacle. But these visitors did not realize that, over and above the two or three hours when they saw the household, there were twenty-two more each day, during which the inner life of the house went on unseen. This inner life had recently, especially during their stay in Moscow, become exceedingly trying for the Princess Maria. In Moscow she was deprived of her dearest pleasures, the visits from her pilgrims, and the solitude which gave her such consolation at Louisa Gurier. She could find no comfort or joy in the crowded city, she did not go into society. Everybody knew that her father would not allow her to go without him, and his health was too precarious to permit him to go out, and consequently she received no invitations to dinner parties or balls. She had renounced all hope of ever getting married. She had too often witnessed the coldness and irritability with which he received and dismissed such young men as occasionally came to their house, and who might have been her suitors. The Princess Maria had no friends, since her arrival in Moscow, her eyes had been opened in regard to the two who had been more intimate with her than all the rest. Mademoiselle Burine, in whom, even in times past, she could not feel perfect confidence, had now become positively disagreeable to her, and for several reasons she felt obliged to hold her at a distance. Julie, with whom she had kept up an uninterrupted correspondence for five years, was in Moscow, but she seemed like an utter stranger to her when they met again face to face. Julie, by the death of her brothers, had become one of the wealthiest girls in Moscow, and was completely absorbed in the pleasures of fashionable society. She was surrounded by young men, who, she said to herself, had suddenly awakened to the appreciation of her merits. She found herself now rapidly growing old, and felt that her last chance of finding a husband was passing, 
and that now or never her fate must be decided. The Princess Maria, with a melancholy smile, remembered, as each Thursday came round, that now she had no one to write to, since Julie, whose presence gave her no delight, was in town, and she could see her every week. She, like the old French émigré, who refused to marry the lady at whose house he had spent all his evenings for a number of years, was sorry that Julie was so near, because now she should have no one to write to. She had no one in Moscow to whom she could confide her sorrows, and since coming there these sorrows had increased and multiplied. The time for Prince Andrei's return and for his marriage was drawing nigh, but his father seemed no more inclined than before to listen to his entreaties and sanction it. On the contrary, he would hear nothing to it, and the mere mention of the Countess Rostova drove the old prince beside himself. As it was, he was in a bad temper the greater part of the time. The Princess Maria had a new and additional trial, at this time, in the lessons which she gave her six-year-old nephew. In her treatment of Nikolushka, she recognized with dismay that she was liable to fits of irritability similar to her father's. No matter how many times she reproached herself for losing her temper during his lesson hours, it happened almost every time when she sat down with the pointer to teach him his French alphabet, that from her very desire to help him along as rapidly as possible, to make his tasks easy and give the little fellow all the superfluity of her own knowledge, the slightest inattention on the part of the little boy, who was afraid, to begin with, of an outbreak of his aunt's irascibility, would make her tremble with indignation, lose her patience, grow angry and raise her voice, and sometimes even seize him by the arm and stand him in the corner. After doing this, she would begin to shed tears over her hasty temper, her ugly nature, and Nikolushka, sobbing out of sympathy, would leave his corner without permission, run up to her, and pull her tear-wet hands from her face and try to comfort her. But by far the greatest trial of all was caused the princess by her father's irritability, which was always vented upon his daughter, and which of late became even cruelty. If he had compelled her to do penance all night long with prayers and genuflections, if he had struck her, if he had compelled her to draw wood and water, it would have never occurred to her that her position was hard. But this loving tyrant, all the more terrible from the very fact that he loved her, and therefore tormented both himself and her, took a special pains not only to insult and humiliate her, but to make her feel that she was always and forever in the wrong and latterly he discovered a new whim, which tormented the Princess Maria more than all else put together. This was his constantly increasing friendship for Mademoiselle Burine. First suggested to his maid by the news of Prince Andrei's engagement, the farcical notion that, if his son were going to marry, then he would marry Burine, evidently flattered his fancy, and of late he had stubbornly lavished especial attentions on the Frenchwoman, for the special purpose, as it seemed to the Princess Maria, of affronting herself and of expressing his disapprobation of his daughter by making love to Burine. In Moscow, on one occasion, when the Princess Maria was present, it seemed to her that her father chose that time on purpose. The old prince kissed Mademoiselle Burine's hand, and, drawing her to him, embraced and fondled her. The Princess Maria flushed with anger and left the room. After a few moments Mademoiselle Burine rejoined her, smiling, and began to tell some entertaining story in her agreeable voice. The Princess Maria hastily wiped away her tears, went with decided steps straight to Burine, and, evidently not knowing what she was doing, began to shout at the Frenchman in furious haste and with explosive accents. It is shameful, contemptible, beastly, to take advantage of a man's weakness. She did not conclude her sentence. Leave my room, she fairly screamed, and then burst into tears again. The following day, the prince said not a word to his daughter, but she observed that at dinner he ordered Mademoiselle Burine to be served in precedence of all others. At the end of the dinner, when the butler, according to his usual custom, handed the coffee round, serving the princess first, the old prince suddenly flew into a passion, flung his cane at Philip, and instantly gave orders that he should be sent to serve as a soldier. "'You didn't obey me. Twice I told you. You didn't obey me.' "'She's the first person in this house. "'She is my best friend,' screamed the prince. "'And if you,' he added, in a perfect fury, "'for the first time addressing his daughter, "'if you permit yourself, if you dare, "'another time, as you did this evening, "'to forget your duty before her, "'then I will show you who is master of this house. 
away with you, out of my sight. Here, beg her pardon. The Princess Maria begged Emily Birine's pardon, and then interceded with her father for the butler Philip. At such moments there arose in the Princess Maria's soul a feeling like the pride of an immolated victim, and then again at such moments this father whom she blamed would either search for his spectacles, not seeing them when they were close at hand, or would forget what had only just happened, or would stagger along on weakening limbs, glancing lest anyone should have seen his feebleness, or, what was worse than all, after dinner, when there were no guests to keep him awake, would suddenly fall into a doze, dropping his napkin and nodding his head over his plate. He is old and feeble, and do I dare to judge him, she would think at such moments, with revulsion of feeling and disgust at herself. End of chapter 2part five chapter three of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter three in eighteen eleven there was living in moscow a french doctor metivier a handsome man of gigantic frame amiable after the manner of his nation and as was said by every one a physician of extraordinary skill he had rapidly become fashionable and was received in the houses of the highest aristocracy not merely as a doctor but as an equal prince nikolai andreitch who had always scoffed at medical science had lately by mademoiselle bourienne's advice consulted this doctor and soon became accustomed to him metivier used to visit him twice a week on the sixth of december o s saint nicholas's day all moscow called at the prince's door but he gave orders to admit no one he commanded, however, that a select few, whose names he handed to the Princess Maria, should be bidden to dinner. Metivier came that morning with his congratulations, and in his capacity of physician took it upon him to violate the orders, de force la consigne, as he expressed it to the Princess Maria, and he went in to see the prince. It chanced that this morning the old prince was in one of his most detestable moods. The whole morning he wandered up and down the house, finding fault with every one, and pretending not to understand anything that was said to him, and that they would not understand him. The Princess Maria knew only too well that this mood betokened a latent and persistent querulousness that was certain to flash out in a tempest of fury, and all that morning, the Prince's name-day, she expected the outbreak, which was sure to go off as a loaded musket at full cock. Until the doctor's arrival, the morning passed in comparative serenity. Having admitted the doctor, the Princess Maria took her book and sat down in the drawing-room, near a door where she could hear all that was going on in the Prince's cabinet. At first she only heard Metivier's voice, then her father's, then both voices speaking at once. Then the door opened, and the dark-haired Metivier appeared on the threshold, his handsome face expressing alarm, followed by the Prince in his nightcap and dressing-gown, his face distorted with passion, and the pupils of his eyes dilated. "'Haven't you any wits?' screamed the prince. "'Well, I have. You slave of Bonaparte! You spy! Out of my house! Get out, I tell you!' And he slammed the door. Metivier, shrugging his shoulders, went to Mademoiselle Bourine, who, on hearing the loud voices, had rushed in from the adjoining room. "'The prince is not very well.' bilious and cerebral congestion i will come in again to-morrow don't be worried said metivier and laying his fingers on his lips he hastened out the prince was heard walking up and down in his room in his slippers and shouting spies traitors traitors everywhere not a moment's peace even in my own house after metivier's departure the old prince summoned his daughter to him and the whole brunt of his fury fell upon her she was to blame for admitting spies into his presence. Why, he had told her, said he, that she was to write down a list, and not to admit any one who was not on that list. Why, then, had she admitted this scoundrel? It was all her fault. He could not have a moment's rest with her, not even die in peace, said he. No, Matushka, you might as well make up your mind to it. We must part. We must part. I can't stand this sort of thing any more, he exclaimed, and left the room. And then, as though fearing that she might not understand how thoroughly his mind was made up, he came back to her, and, endeavoring to assume an expression of calmness, he added, 
and don't you for a moment imagine that i say this to you in passion no i am perfectly calm and i have made up my mind after full deliberation and it shall be we must part find a home somewhere else but he could not restrain himself and with a flash of indignation possible only to one who loves he though evidently suffering himself shook his fist in her face and screamed and why on earth hasn't some idiot taken her for his wife he slammed the door after him and mademoiselle burine called to him and quiet reigned in his cabinet at two o'clock the six persons invited to dinner arrived these guests the distinguished count rostovchin prince lupukhin and his nephew general chatrov an old companion in arms of the princes and for young men pierre and boris dubretskoy were waiting for him in the drawing-room having recently come to moscow on leave of absence boris had been anxious to make the acquaintance of prince nikolai andreitch and he had so far succeeded in winning his good graces that the prince made an exception in his case and received him in spite of his being an eligible young bachelor the prince's house was not what one calls fashionable but it was the centre of a small circle which though it made little noise in the city gave a more flattering distinction than any other to those who were admitted to it this was made evident to boris a week before when he overheard rostopchin tell the governor-general of the city who invited him to dinner on st nicholas's day that it was impossible on that day i always go and worship the relics of prince nikolai andreitch oh yes yes replied the governor-general how is he the little company gathered before dinner in the old-fashioned high-studded drawing-room with its ancient furniture was like the gathering of a solemn court of justice no one had much to say and if they spoke it was in low tones prince nikolai andreitch came in silent and preoccupied the princess maria seemed even more quiet and timid than usual the guests took no pains to talk with her for they saw that she was not attending to what they said count rostopchin was the only one who kept up the thread of conversation speaking now of the latest news in the city and now of politics in general lupopkin and the old general rarely took any share in it prince nikolai andreitch listened as a superior judge listens to a report presented to him only by his significant silence or by some curt monosyllable now and then showing that he followed the drift of what was said the tone of the conversation made it evident that no one took any satisfaction in what was going on in the political world they spoke of recent events as though they were convinced that everything was going from bad to worse but in all their anecdotes and criticisms it was noticeable how each speaker came to a stop or was brought to a stop every time at that borderland where there was any possibility of personal reflections on his majesty the emperor the conversation at dinner turned on the most recent political news the seizure by napoleon of the possessions of the duke of oldenburg and the russian note hostile to napoleon which had been dispatched to all the courts throughout europe bonaparte treats europe as a pirate treats the ships he has captured said count rostopchin repeating an epigram that he had already got off a number of times before you can only marvel at the forbearance or blindness of the sovereigns now it is the pope's turn and bonaparte is calmly proceeding to humiliate the head of the catholic religion and not a voice is raised in protest our sovereign is the only one who protests against the occupation of the duchy of oldenburg but then count rostopchin came to a pause conscious of having reached that point where criticism was impossible he was offered other positions instead of oldenburg said prince nikolai andreitch just as i transfer peasants from luisia guriai to bogucharovo or to my raisin estates he does with dukes the duke of oldenburg shows great force of character and bears his misfortune with admirable resignation said boris modestly joining the conversation he made this remark because on his way from petersburg he had been honoured with an introduction to the duke prince nikolai andreitch gave the young man a look as though he had it in his mind to make some reply to this but checked himself feeling that boris was too young for him to waste his sarcasm upon i have read our protest in regard to the oldenburg affair and was amazed at the bad style in which it was written said count rostopchin in the easy-going tone of a man who knows perfectly well what he is talking about pierre looked at rostopchin in naive amazement unable to comprehend why he should be disturbed at the wretched style of the note what difference does it make how the note was written count provided the subject matter is vigorous said he my dear fellow i think with our army of five hundred thousand men it might just as well have been couched in a good style said count rostopchin 
Pierre understood now why Count Rostopchin was disturbed by the wretched writing of the note. "'It seems to me there's a plentiful crop of penny aligners nowadays,' said the old prince. "'Yonder in Petersburg everybody is writing not only notes, but new laws, all the time. My Andrusia has been scribbling a whole volume of laws for Russia there. Today everybody is scribbling.' and he laughed unnaturally. The conversation languished for a moment. Then the old general called attention to himself by a preliminary cough. "'Have you heard of what took place recently at a review at Petersburg? How the new French ambassador acted?' "'What was that? Yes, I heard something about it. He made a very awkward remark in His Majesty's presence, I believe.' "'His Majesty called attention to the division of grenadiers and their splendid marching,' pursued General Chartoff. But it seems the ambassador showed absolute indifference, and permitted himself to say that at home in France they did not waste their time on such trivialities. The sovereign did not deign to give him any answer, but they say that at the subsequent review he did not say a word to him. All were silent. It was out of the question to make any comment on this occurrence, since it concerned the monarch personally. "'Insolent wretches!' exclaimed the prince. "'Do you know Metivier? I showed him out of the house to-day.' He came and was admitted, although I had given special orders to admit no one, said the prince, with an angry look at his daughter. And then he repeated his whole conversation with the French doctor, and gave the reasons that made him think Metivier a spy. Though these reasons were inconclusive and obscure, no one made any criticism. After the roast, the champagne was handed around. The guests rose to their feet, offering the old prince their congratulations. The princess Maria also went round to him. He gave her a cold, angry look, and put up his wrinkled, clean-shaven cheek for her to kiss. The whole expression of his face told her that their conversation of the morning had not been forgotten, that his mind was just as fully made up, and that only the presence of his guests prevented him from saying the same thing over again. When they went into the drawing-room for coffee, the older members of the company sat down together. Prince Nikolai Andreyitch grew more animated and expressed his mind freely in regard to the war than just beginning. He declared that our wars with Bonaparte had hitherto been unsuccessful and would be so long as we tried to make common cause with the Germans and meddle with European affairs as we were compelled to do by the presence of Tilsit. There was no sense in our battling either for or against Austria. Our policy lay in the east, and, as far as Bonaparte was concerned, we required only one thing— to protect our frontier, to have some firmness in our policy, and never let him dare to cross our Russian frontier, as he did in 1807. "'And how is it possible for us to fight against the French, Prince?' asked Count Rostopchin. "'Can we take up arms against our teachers, our gods? Look at our young men, look at our young ladies. Our gods are the French, our kingdom of heaven is Paris.' He had raised his voice, evidently so that all might hear him. "'Our costumes are French.' Our ideas are French. Our sentiments are French. You put out Metivier because he is a Frenchman, a good-for-nothing fellow. But our ladies grovel before him on their very knees. And last evening, at a party, out of the five ladies, three were Roman Catholics, and these were working on canvas embroidery, on Sunday, by virtue of a dispensation from the Pope. And there they sat, almost naked for all the world like signboards for a public bathhouse, if I may be allowed the expression. Ech! When I look at our young dandies, Prince, I feel inclined to take the cudgel of Peter the Great from the museum and break the ribs for them in good old Russian style. That would put an end to all their whimsies. All were silent. The old prince, with a smile on his face, looked at Rostopchin and nodded his head in assent. Well, Prince Chetty, good-bye. Your illustriousness, take care of your health, said Rostopchin, rising with the abrupt motions characteristic of him and offering his hand. Goodbye, my dear. You're like a lute. I always like to hear you, said the old prince, lying his hand on his arm and offering his cheek for a kiss. The others also got up with Rostopchin. End of chapter 3 Part 5, Chapter 4 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 4 Princess Maria, as she sat in the drawing-room and listened to the conversation and criticisms of the old men, understood nothing of what she heard. 
her sole preoccupation was whether these guests had remarked the ill will that her father showed toward her she had not even noticed the peculiar attentions and civilities showed her all throughout the dinner hour by drubetskoy who was now making his third visit to the house the princess with a strangely abstracted and questioning glance turned to pierre who hat in hand and with a smiling face was the last of the guests to come and pay her his parting respects after the old prince had retired thus it happened that the two were left together in the drawing-room may i stay a little longer he asked suiting his action to the word by depositing his corpulent frame on an easy chair near the princess maria oh yes certainly replied she her glance seemed to ask have you remarked anything unusual pierre was now in a happy after-dinner frame of mind he gazed musingly straight forward and smiled gently have you known that young man long princess he asked what young man drubetskoy no not very long well do you like him yes he is a pleasant young fellow why do you ask said the princess her mind still on her morning's conversation with her father because i have made a discovery the young man has come on leave of absence from petersburg with the sole and special purpose of marrying a rich wife you have made that discovery exclaimed the princess maria yes pursued pierre with a smile and this young man so manages it that where the rich girls are gathered together there he also is to be found he is now undecided which to attack you or mademoiselle julie Karagina. il est très assidu auprès d'elle yes he's very attentive to her he goes there then yes very often and do you know the new way of making love inquired pierre with a cheery smile evidently lapsing into that jolly spirit of good-humoured ridicule for which he so often had reproached himself in his diary no replied the princess in these days in order to please the young ladies of moscow il fell être melancolique et elle est très melancolique auprès de mademoiselle caragarine said pierre really exclaimed the princess gazing into pierre's good face and persistently thinking about her trials it would be so much easier she thought if i could only make up my mind to confide in some one all my thoughts and feelings and i should like especially to tell pierre everything he is so good and noble it would certainly be easier for me he would give me his advice would you marry him asked pierre oh good gracious count there are times when i would marry any one suddenly exclaimed the princess maria unexpectedly to herself and with tears in her voice ach how hard it is to love a near kinsman and feel that no matter though she went on to say with trembling voice you cannot do anything for him but only annoy him and when you know that you cannot help things otherwise then there is only one thing only one thing to do to go away but where could i go what is it what is the matter with you princess but the princess without being able longer to control herself burst into tears i don't know what is the matter with me to-day do not criticize me forget what i have said to you all pierre's gaiety was gone he anxiously questioned the princess begging her to tell him everything to confide her trials to him but her only reply was to beseech him to forget what she had said that she herself did not remember what she had said and that she had no trials except the one which he knew about already that prince andrei's marriage threatened to bring about a quarrel between her father and brother have you heard anything about the rostovs she asked for the purpose of diverting the conversation i am told that they will be here soon andrei also i am expecting any day i should have liked for them to meet here and how does he look upon the matter now asked pierre meaning by the pronoun the old prince her father the princess maria shook her head but what is to be done the year will be up now in a few months and this can never be i only wish i could spare my brother the first minutes i wish the rostovs would come very soon i hope to make their acquaintance you have known them for a long time have you not asked the princess maria tell me with your hand on your heart exactly the honest truth what kind of a girl is she and how do you like her i want the whole truth because andre you know takes such a tremendous risk in doing this against his father's will that i should like to know just how it is 
a dull instinct told pierre that in this repeated demand to hear the whole truth was betrayed the princess maria's ill-will toward her prospective sister-in-law and that she had an idea that pierre would not approve of prince andrei's choice but pierre told her not so much what he thought as felt i don't know how to answer your question he said reddening without any reason i really don't know what kind of a girl she is i can never analyze her she is fascinating but what makes her so i can't tell you that is all i can say in regard to her the princess maria sighed and the expression of her face said yes that is what i expected and feared is she intellectual asked the princess pierre deliberated i think not said he but perhaps she is she does not think it necessary to be intellectual but on the other hand she is fascinating no one more so the princess maria again shook her head disapprovingly Ugh, how i hope that i shall love her you tell her so if you see her before i do i hear that they will be here in a few days said pierre the princess maria confided to pierre her plan for making the acquaintance of her prospective sister-in-law as soon as she came to moscow and then trying to reconcile the old prince to her End of chapter 4part five chapter five of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter five boris had not succeeded in making a match with any of the rich petersburg heiresses and he had gone to moscow with the same object in view there he found himself undecided between two of the wealthiest girls in town julie and the princess maria although the princess maria in spite of her plain features seemed to him more attractive than julie karagina there were difficulties in the way of paying his addresses to bolkonsky's daughter at his last meeting with her on the old prince's name-day she had replied to all his tentative remarks on the subject of the feelings so at haphazard that it was evident that she had not heard what he said julie on the other hand received his attentions only too gladly though in a way peculiar to herself alone julie was twenty-seven after the death of her brother she had become very rich she was now very far from being a beauty but she had conceived the idea that not only was she as pretty but far more captivating than she had ever been before in this illusion she was sustained by the facts that in the first place she had become a very rich maiden and in the second place as she grew older and older men found her less dangerous and were able to gather round her with more freedom since they felt that they were not incurring any obligations in taking advantages of the suppers receptions and jolly society in general that frequented her house men who ten years before would have thought a second time about going every day to a house where there was a young girl of seventeen lest they should compromise her and get entangled themselves now unhesitatingly appeared there daily and treated her not as a marriageable damsel but as an acquaintance irrespective of sex the karagins that winter entertained more pleasantly and hospitably than any one else in moscow besides the formal receptions and state dinners they every day entertained a numerous society especially of men who ate supper at midnight and broke up at three o'clock in the morning nor was julie willing to miss a ball an entertainment or a new play at the theatre her toilettes were always in the height of the fashion but nevertheless julie pretended to be disenchanted with all life she told everybody that she had no belief in friendship or in love or in any of the pleasures of this world and hoped for peace only yonder she affected the tone of a maiden who has endured great disappointment of one for instance who had been disappointed in the man she loved or cruelly deceived in him although nothing of the sort had ever happened to her it began to be thought that such was the case and she herself came to believe that her sufferings in life had been grievous this melancholia did not stand in the way of her enjoying herself or prevent the young men who came to her house from having a delightful time there every guest who went there paid his tribute to his hostess's melancholic mood and then fell to talking about the things of this world and dancing and intellectual games and the capping of verses or borim which were greatly in vogue at the Kerrigans. Some few of the young men, Boris among them, took a deeper interest in Julie's melancholy moods, and with these young men she had longer and more confidential conversations about the vanity of all things terrestrial, and she showed them her albums, filled with gloomy drawings, apothems, and couplets. 
Julie treated Boris with a special favor. She mourned with him over his lost illusions. She offered him those consolations of friendship which she was so well able to offer, having herself suffered so much in life. She also showed him her album. Boris made a sketch of two trees with the legend, O solitary trees, your dark boughs scatter down upon me gloom and melancholy. On another page he drew a picture of a tomb and wrote, "'Tis death that gives us succor, death that gives us peace. Alas, tis then alone that earthly sorrows cease." Julie declared that couplet to be charming. "'There's something so ravishing in the smile of melancholy,' said she to Boris, quoting, word for word, a passage from a book she was reading. "'Tis a ray of light falling in darkness, a shadow's difference between sorrow and despair, affording the hope of coming consolation. Whereupon Boris wrote for her these lines. O, oh, poisoned ailment of souls too sensitive, thou that alone doth make it sweet for me to live, mild melancholy, come, thy consolation bring, the torments of my gloomy solitude, O, oh, calm, mingle thy secret soothing balm with tears that never cease to spring. Julie played on her harp, for Boris, her most melancholy nocturnes. Boris read aloud to her, poor Liza, and more than once had to pause in his reading because of the emotion which overmastered him. When they met in society, Julie and Boris exchanged glances to signify that they were the only people in the world capable of understanding and appreciating each other. Anna Mikhailovna, who was a frequent visitor at the Karagins, and always managed to be a partner with Julie's mother, took a special pains to procure all possible information in regard to Julie's fortune, which consisted of two estates in the vicinity of Penza and forest lands near Nizhny Novgorod. Anna Mikhailovna, with humble dependence on the will of Providence and with deep emotion, looked upon the etherealized melancholy which served as a bond between her son and the wealthy Julie. Toujours charmante et melancolique, cette chère Julie, she would say to the daughter. Boris says that here in your house he finds rest for his soul. He has suffered the loss of so many illusions, and he is so sensitive, she would say to the mother. Ach, my dear, I cannot tell you how devoted I am to Julie of late, she would say to her son. And who could help loving her? She is such a celestial creature. Ach, Boris, Boris, she was silent for a minute. And how sorry I am for her maman, she went on to say. Today she was showing me her accounts and letters from Penza, where they have colossal estates, and it is so trying for her to have no one to help her. They cheat her so. Boris's face wore an almost imperceptible smile as he listened to his mother's words. He was quietly amused at her transparent shrewdness, but he listened to her and sometimes asked her questions in regard to these Prenzensk and Nitegorodsky properties. Julie had for some time been looking for a proposal from her melancholy-souled adorer, and she was ready to accept him, but some secret antipathy toward her, a distaste of her evident desire to get married, and of her affections, and a feeling of horror at thus practically repudiating the bliss of true love, still kept Boris at a distance. His leave of absence was now drawing to a close. He spent long hours, and every Sunday, at the Kerrigan's, and every day, when he came to think the matter over, he would decide that his proposal should take place on the morrow. But when he was in Julie's company, and saw her red face and chin, almost always dusted with powder, her moist eyes and the expression of her face, which seemed ready, at a moment's notice, to fly from melancholy to the equally natural enthusiasm and rapture of wedded bliss, Boris could not bring himself to utter the decisive words— although in his imagination he had for some time looked upon himself as the prospective master of the Kerrigan estates, and had many times overspent the income arising therefrom. Julie noticed Boris's infirmity of purpose, and it sometimes occurred to her that he had an antipathy for her, but her feminine vanity quickly restored her confidence, and she would assure herself that it was merely his love that made him so bashful. Her melancholia, however, was beginning to change into vexation, and a short time before the time of Boris's departure, she was thinking of adopting some decisive plan. Just before Boris's leave of absence drew to a close, Anatole Kurigan made his appearance in Moscow, and, as a matter of course, in the Kerrigan's drawing-room. And Julie, abruptly arousing from her melancholy, became very cheerful and manifested great friendliness toward Kurigan. Mon cher, said Anna Mikhailovna to her son, 
i know on good authority that prince vasili has sent his son to moscow to make a match with julie i am so fond of julie that i should be very sorry for her what do you think about it my dear asked anna mikhailovna boris was thoroughly humiliated at the thought of being left out in the cold and of having wasted his whole month in arduous melancholic service of julie and of seeing another man especially such an idiot as anatole having control of that income from the Prinzensk estates which he was already in his imagination enjoying and profiting by he went to the kerrigans with a full determination to offer himself julie met him with a gay and careless mien giving him a merry account of what a good time she had enjoyed at the ball the evening before and asked him when he was going back in spite of the fact that boris had come with the intention of confessing his love and had therefore decided to be tenderly sentimental he immediately began in a tone of irritation to complain of women's inconstancy pointing out how easy it was for women to shift from gloom to glee and that their moods depended wholly upon the one who happened to be dancing attendance upon them julie took offence at this and declared that he was right that women needed variety and nothing was more annoying to any one than to have a perpetual sameness then i should advise you began boris with the intention of winging a sharp retort but at that instant came the humiliating thought that he was on the point of leaving moscow without attaining his wished-for end and at the cost of wasted labour a thing to which he was unaccustomed he paused in the middle of his sentence dropped his eyes to avoid seeing the look of disagreeable annoyance and indecision on her face and said however it was not at all for the purpose of quarrelling with you that i came here on the contrary he looked at her to see whether she would encourage him to proceed all expression of annoyance had suddenly vanished and her restless imploring eyes were fixed upon him with greedy expectation i can always manage so as to keep out of her way thought boris here i am for it might as well finish he flushed crimson raised his eyes to hers and said you know my sentiments toward you there was no need of saying more julie's face had become radiant with triumph and satisfaction but she compelled boris to tell her all that was customary to say in such circumstances to tell her that he loved her and that he had never loved any one else so passionately she knew that in exchange for her penzensk estates and nizagorodsky forests she had a right to exact this and she obtained what she wished the young couple with no further thoughts of solitary trees shedding gloom and melancholy laid their plans for the future establishment of a magnificent home in petersburg made calls and got everything ready for a brilliant wedding end of chapter five part five chapter six of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Marianne. chapter six count ilya andreyevitch together with natasha and sonya arrived in moscow toward the end of january the countess was still ailing and was unable to travel but it was out of the question to wait for her recovery prince andrei was expected in moscow every day and besides it was important to purchase natasha's wedding outfit it was necessary to sell the podmoskovnaya estate and it was necessary to take advantage of the old prince's presence in moscow in order that he might become acquainted with his future daughter-in-law the rostovs moscow house had not been warmed besides they were to be in town for only a short time and the countess was not with them accordingly ilya andreyitch decided to accept the hospitality of Maria Dmitrievna Akrovzimova, who had long ago urged them to come to her. Late one evening, the four coaches on runners, conveying the Rostovs, drove into Maria Dmitrievna's courtyard on the old Kanyushinaya Street. Maria Dmitrievna lived alone. Her daughter was married. All of her sons were in the government service. She was just as erect as ever. Her words were as much to the point. She always expressed her opinion to everyone in a loud and decided voice, and her whole personality seemed to be a living reproach against all weaknesses, passions, and impulses, the necessity of which she utterly denied. From early morning, dressed in her jacket, she gave personal attention to the domestic arrangements, and then went out for a drive, if it were a holy day, to mass, and thence to the prisons and jails, where she had business that she never mentioned to anyone on ordinary days on finishing her toilet she received applicants of every rank and condition who chanced to come to her door 
her charities having been dispensed she dined and this abundant and well-ordered meal was always shared by three or four guests after dinner she made up a table for boston late in the evening she had newspapers or some new book read aloud to her while she sat with her knitting she rarely accepted invitations and if she ever made any exceptions it was only in favor of the most important personages of the city she had not yet retired when the rostovs arrived as the door into the hall creaked on its hinges and admitted the travellers and their retinue of servants together with a rush of cold air marya dmitrievna with her spectacles toward the end of her nose came and stood in the doorway her head erect and gazed at the visitors with a stern and solemn face one might have thought that she was really angry and was about to turn the intruders out if she had not been heard at that very instant to give the most urgent orders in regard to the disposition of her guests and their luggage the counts bring them this way said she indicating certain trunks and not stopping to greet any of the party the young ladies this way to the left well and what are you gaping there for she cried to the maids have the samovar got ready plumper and prettier than ever she cried taking possession of natasha whose face under her hood was all rosy with the cold foo how cold you are there get off your wraps as quick as ever you can she cried to the count who was bending over to kiss her hand you're frozen most likely have some rum put in with the tea sonyushka bonjour said she to sonya showing by this french phrase and the pet diminutive her rather condescending and yet affectionate relationship to the girl when they had taken off their wraps and put themselves to rights after their journey they gathered round the tea-table and marya dmitrievna kissed them all in turn i am right glad that you have come and that you have put up at my house said she it is high time she went on giving natasha a significant look the old man is here and his son is expected from day to day you must you certainly must make his acquaintance well we'll talk about all this by and by she added giving sonya a look as much as to say that she did not care to talk about this in her presence now listen said she addressing the count what are your plans for to-morrow whom will you send for shinshin she doubled over one finger then that snivelling anna mikhailovna too she and her son are here sons to be married then buzakoy i suppose he and his wife are here he ran away from her but she came traipsing after him he dined with me on wednesday well then and these she indicated the young ladies i will take them to-morrow to the iverskaya chapel and then to albert chalmay's of course everything will have to be got new for them don't judge by me such sleeves they wear these days recently the young princess irina vasilyevna came to call upon me she was a marvel to see she had sleeves like two barrels on her arms you see there's some new fashion every day and what business have you on hand she asked turning sternly upon the count everything in the quickest possible time replied the count to buy the girls duds and to find a purchaser for my podmotskovanyoa land and house and so if you will allow me i will tear myself away for a little while and slip off to marinskoya for a day and leave my girls with you very good very good they'll be safe with me they couldn't be safer with the orphans aid society i'll take them wherever they need to go and scold them and spoil them with flattery said marya dmitrievna stroking with her big hand the cheek of her favorite goddaughter natasha the following morning they went to pray before the iverskaya virgin and to see mademoiselle auberchame who stood in such awe of marya dmitrievna that in order to get rid of her as soon as possible she would always sell her goods at a positive loss marya dmitrievna ordered there the larger part of the trousseau on their return she drove everybody else out of the room and called natasha to her armchair now then we can have a talk i congratulate you on your choice you have secured a fine young man i am glad for you i have known him ever since he was so high she put her hand an arshin from the floor natasha colored with pleasure i am fond of him and of all his family now listen you know very well that the old prince nikolai is very averse to having his son marry a whimsical old man however prince andrei is not a child and his permission is not necessary still it is not pleasant to enter a family against their will 
we must act quietly and with tact you are clever we will manage to bring him round where he ought to be you must accomplish it by your sweetness and cleverness that's all it requires and it will come out all right natasha made no reply from shyness marya dmitrievna supposed but in reality because it was so annoying to natasha that any one should meddle with her love affair with prince andrei for it seemed to her so entirely above and beyond all ordinary human concerns that no one else in her opinion could understand it she loved and admired prince andrei alone he loved her and was coming in a few days and would make her his that was all sufficient you see i have known him for a long time and mashenka also your future sister-in-law i am fond of her in spite of the proverb about husbands sisters she would not hurt a fly she asked me to introduce her to you you and your father must go there to-morrow be sure to be very sweet to her for you are younger than she is before your friend comes you will have already become acquainted with his sister and his father and they will have grown fond of you am i not right isn't that best yes replied natasha with little heartiness End of chapter six Part five, chapter seven of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter seven. On the following day, by Marya Dmitrievna's advice, Count Ilya Andreyitch and Natasha went to call on Prince Volkonsky's. The Count, in anything but a happy frame of mind, made ready for this call. In fact, he felt terribly about it. He remembered too well his last encounter with the old prince, at the time of the mobilizing of the militia, when, in answer to his invitation to a dinner-party, he had received an angry reprimand for not having furnished his full quota of men. Natasha, however, having put on her best gown, was in the most radiant spirits. "'They cannot help being fond of me,' she said to herself. "'Everyone likes me, and I am so willing to do for them all they could wish.' I am so willing to love him because he is his father, and to love her because she is his sister, that they cannot fail to love me. They drove up to the gloomy old house on Vazvinhenka Street, and went into the entry. "'Well, God have mercy on us!' exclaimed the Count, half in jest, half in earnest. But Natasha observed that her father was very much agitated as he hastened into the anteroom and asked, in a timid, faltering voice, if the prince and the princess were at home. After their names had been sent in, the prince's servants seemed to be thrown into great perplexity. The footman, who had hurried off to announce them, was stopped by another footman at the drawing-room door, and the two began to whisper together. A chambermaid came hurrying into the hall, and she also had something to say to them in reference to the princess. Finally a stern-faced, elderly footman approached the Rostovs, and announced that the old prince was unable to receive them, but the princess would be glad to see them. Mademoiselle Burine first came to receive the visitors. She met them with more than ordinary politeness, and conducted them to the princess. The princess, agitated and nervous, her face covered with crimson patches, hastened forward, stepping heavily, and vainly endeavoring to appear calm and dignified. At first sight Natasha did not please her. It seemed to her that she was too fashionably dressed, too frivolous, flighty, and conceited. The Princess Maria did not realize that even before seeing her future sister-in-law she was prejudiced against her through an involuntary envy of her beauty, youth, and happiness, and jealousy of her brother's love for her. Over and above these obscure feelings of antipathy, the Princess Maria was still more agitated from the fact that when the Rostovs were announced— the prince had shouted at the top of his voice that he would not have anything to do with them, that the Princess Maria might receive them as she so desired, but that they should not come into his presence. The princess determined to receive them, but she was afraid lest at any minute the prince might perform some act of rudeness, since he seemed greatly stirred up by the Rostovs' arrival. "'I have brought my little songstress, my dear princess,' said the count, with a bow and a scrape, and looking round anxiously, as though he were afraid of the old prince appearing on the scene. I am very anxious for you to become acquainted. I am sorry, very sorry, that the prince is ill. And, after making a few commonplace remarks, he got up, saying, If you will excuse me, princess, I will leave my Natasha with you for a brief quarter of an hour, 
while I slip out and call on Anna Semyonovna, who lives only a couple of steps from here. I will come back for her. Ilya Andreyitch, as he afterwards told his daughter, conceived this master stroke of subtle diplomacy for the purpose of giving the future sisters-in-law a chance to get better acquainted. But he had another reason besides, which was that he might escape the possibility of meeting the prince. This reason he did not confess to his daughter, but Natasha perceived this timidity and anxiety of her father's, and felt abused. She blushed for him, and was still more annoyed with herself for having blushed, and she looked straight at the princess with a defiant, challenging expression that seemed to imply that there was nothing she was afraid of. The princess told the count that he was perfectly excusable, and only hoped that he would make his stay at Anna Semyonovna's as long as possible. Accordingly, Ilya Andreyitch took his departure. Mademoiselle Burine, in spite of the anxious, beseeching glances given her by the Princess Maria, who was anxious to have a confidential talk with Natasha, did not see fit to leave the room, and kept up a steady stream of chatter about the delights of Moscow and the theatres. Natasha was piqued by the confusion that had occurred in the reception room, by her father's cowardice, and by the unnatural tone affected by the princess, who, it seemed to her, felt it was an act of condescension to receive her, and, consequently, everything gave her a disagreeable impression. The princess Maria displeased her. She thought she was very plain, stubborn, and unsympathetic. Natasha suddenly underwent a moral shrinking, as it were, and, in spite of herself, assumed such a reckless tone that the princess Maria was still further alienated from her. After five minutes of a labored and artificial conversation, slippered feet were heard rapidly approaching. Into the Princess Maria's face came a sudden look of dismay. The door opened, and the old prince came in, dressed in a white nightcap and dressing gown. "'Ach! Suda Ruyinya, he exclaimed. "'Suda Ruyinya, Countess, Countess Rostova, if I am not mistaken. "'I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. I did not know. Suda Ruyinya. For God, I did not know that you were honoring us with your presence. I was coming to see my daughter, which explains this costume. I beg you to pardon it. For God, I did not know, he said for the second time, in such an unnatural tone, laying such a special stress on the word God, and speaking so disagreeably, that the Princess Maria got up and dropped her eyes, not daring to look either at her father or at Natasha. Natasha got up and then sat down again, and likewise knew not what to do. Only Mademoiselle Burine wore a pleasant smile. "'I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. For God I did not know,' grumbled the old prince, and, after staring at Natasha from head to foot, he left the room. Mademoiselle Burine was the first to recover self-possession after this apparition, and she began to talk about the prince's failing health. Natasha and the princess looked at each other without speaking, and the longer they looked at each other without expressing what they ought to have said— the more they were confirmed in their mutual dislike. When the Count returned, Natasha made an ill-mannered display of relief, and immediately prepared to take her departure. At this moment she almost hated this dried-up old princess, who by her silence had put her in such an awkward position, and who, in half an hour's talk with her, had not once mentioned Prince André. "'Of course I can't be the first to speak of him in the presence of that French woman,' said Natasha to herself." The Princess Maria, at the same time, was tormented by a similar compunction. She knew that it was her duty to say something to Natasha, but she found it impossible, both because Mademoiselle Burine's presence embarrassed her, and because she herself did not know what made it so difficult to speak on the coming marriage. After the Count had already left the room, Princess Maria went to Natasha with hurried steps, seized her hand, and with a deep sigh said, "'Wait a moment. I must—' Natasha gave the Princess Maria a satirical glance, though she could not have told what made her do so, and listened. "'My dear Nathalie,' said the Princess Maria, "'you must know I am delighted my brother has found happiness.' She paused with a consciousness that she was not telling the truth. Natasha noticed this pause and suspected the cause of it. "'I think, Princess, that it is not a propitious time to speak of this,' said Natasha, with an appearance of outward dignity and hauteur, while the tears almost choked her. "'What have I said? What have I said?' she wondered, as soon as she left the room. That day they waited for Natasha a long time at dinner. She was sitting in her room, sobbing like a child, blowing her nose, and then beginning to sob again. Sonya stood beside her and kissed her on the hair. 
Natasha, what is there to cry about? she asked. Why should you care about them? It will all pass over, Natasha. No, if you only knew how humiliating it was. I was just like... Don't speak of it, Natasha. Of course you are not to blame. Then why should you let it trouble you? Kiss me, said Sonya. Natasha lifted her head and kissed her friend on the lips, laying her tear-wet face next to hers. I cannot tell you. I do not know. No one is to blame, said Natasha. If anyone is, I am. But all this is terribly painful. Ugh, oh, why does he not come? She went down to dinner with reddened eyes. Marya Dmitrievna, who had learned how the Rostovs had been received at the prince's, pretended to pay no attention to Natasha's disconsolate face, and jested in loud and eager tones with the Count and her other guests. End of chapter 7Part 5, Chapter 8 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 8 That evening, the Rostovs went to the opera, Maria Dmitrievna having secured them tickets. Natasha felt no desire to go, but it was impossible for her to refuse her hostess's kindness, which had been designed expressly for her pleasure. When, after she was already dressed, and had gone into the parlour to wait for her father, she surveyed herself in the great pier-glass, and saw how pretty, how very pretty, she was. She felt even more melancholy than before, but her melancholy was mingled with a feeling of sweet and passionate love. Vos moi, if he were only here, I should not be so stupidly shy before him as I was before. I would throw my arms around him and cling close to him, and make him look at me with those deep, penetrating eyes of his, with which he has so often looked at me, and then I would make him laugh, as he laughed then, and his eyes, how plainly I can see his eyes even now, said Natasha to herself. And what do I care for his father and his sister? I love him, I love him, him alone, with his dear face and eyes, with his smile, like that of a man, and like that of a child, too. No, it is better not to think about it, to forget him and to forget that time, too, absolutely. I cannot endure this suspense. I shall be crying again. And she turned away from the mirror, exercising all her self-control not to burst into tears. And how can Sonya be so calm and unconcerned in her love for Nikolenka, and wait so long and patiently, she wondered, as she saw her cousin coming toward her, also in full dress, and with her fan in her hand. No, she is entirely different from me. I cannot. Natasha at that moment felt herself so full of passion and tenderness that it was not enough to love and to know that she was loved. What she wanted now, at this instant, was to throw her arms around her lover's neck and speak to him and hear him speak those words of love of which her heart was full. As she rode along in the carriage, sitting next to her father, and dreamily looking at the lamplights that flashed through the frost-covered windows, she felt still deeper in love and still more melancholy than ever, and she quite forgot with whom and where she was going. Their carriage fell into the long line, and the wheels slowly creaked over the snow as they drew up to the steps of the theatre. The two girls gathered up their skirts and quickly jumped out. The Count clambered down, supported by the footman, and, making their way through the throng of ladies and gentlemen and programme vendors, the three went into the corridor that led to their box. Already the sounds of music were heard through the closed doors. Nathalie, your hair, whispered Sonia in French. The Capaldiner, hastening past the ladies, politely opened their box door. The music sounded louder. The brightly lighted rows of boxes occupied by ladies with bared shoulders and arms, and the parterre filled with brilliant uniforms, dazzled their eyes. A lady who entered the adjoining box shot a glance of feminine envy at Natasha. The curtain was still down, and the orchestra was playing the overture. Natasha, shaking out her train, went forward with Sonya and took her seat, glancing at the brightly lighted boxes on the opposite side of the house. The sensation, which she had not experienced for a long time, of having hundreds of eyes staring at her bare arms and neck, affected her all at once with mixed pleasure and discomfort, and called up a whole swarm of recollections, desires, and emotions associated with that sensation. 
Natasha and Sonya, both remarkably pretty girls, and Count Ilya Andreyitch, who had not been seen for a long time in Moscow, naturally attracted attention. Moreover, everyone had a general notion that Natasha was engaged to marry Prince Andrei, and everybody knew that ever since the engagement the Rostovs had been residing at their country estate, therefore they looked with much curiosity at the bride of one of the most desirable men in Russia. Natasha's beauty, as everybody told her, had improved during their stay in the country, and that evening, owing to her excited state of mind, she was extraordinarily beautiful. No one could have failed to be struck by her exuberance of life and beauty, and her complete indifference to everything going on around her. Her dark eyes wandered over the throng, not seeking for anyone in particular, and her slender arm, bare above the elbow, leaned on the velvet rim of the box, while with evident unconsciousness of what she was doing, she crumpled her program, folding and unfolding it in time with the orchestra. "'Look, there's Elenina,' said Sonya, "'with her mother, I think.' "'Saints! Mikhail Kirilluitch has grown fat, though,' exclaimed the old count. "'See, there's our Anna Mikhailovna. What kind of a headdress has she on? There are the Karagans and Boris with them, evidently enough an engaged couple. Drubetskoy must have proposed.' "'What? Didn't you know it? "'Twas announced to-day,' said Shinshin, coming into their box. Natasha looked in the same direction that her father was looking, and saw Julie, who, with a string of pearls around her fat red neck, covered with powder, as Natasha knew well, was sitting next to her mother with a radiantly happy face. Behind them could be seen Boris's handsome head, with sleekly brushed hair. He was leaning over so that his ear was close to Julie's mouth, and, as he looked askance at the Rostovs, he was saying something to his bride. "'They're talking about us, about me,' thought Natasha, "'and she's probably jealous of me, and he is trying to calm her. They need not worry about it. If they only knew how little I cared about them!' Behind them sat Anna Mikhailovna, festive and blissful, and wearing her habitual expression of utter resignation to God's will. Their box was redolent, of the atmosphere characteristic of a newly engaged couple, which Natasha knew and loved so well. She turned away, and suddenly all the humiliating circumstances of her morning visit recurred to her memory. "'What right has he not to be willing to receive me as a relation? Ugh! I think it best not to think about this, at least not till he comes back,' she said to herself, and she began to scan the faces of strangers or acquaintances in the parterre. In the front row, in the very middle of the house, leaning his back against the railing, stood Dolokhov, in Persian costume, with his curly hair combed back into a strange and enormous ridge. He was standing in full view of the whole theatre, knowing that he was attracting the attention of everybody in the house, yet looking as unconcerned as though he were in the privacy of his own room. Around him were gathered a throng of the gilded youth of Moscow, and it was evident that he was their leader." Count Ilya Andreyitch, with a smile, nudged the blushing Sonya, and called her attention to her former suitor. "'Do you recognize him? And where did he turn up from?' asked the Count of Shinshin. "'He had disappeared entirely, had he not?' "'Yes, completely,' replied Shinshin. "'While he was in the Caucasus he deserted, and they say he became a minister to some reigning prince in Persia. After that he killed the Shah's brother.' and now all the young ladies of Moscow have lost their wits over him. Dolokhov Leperzin, and that's the end of it. Here with us there's nothing to be done without Dolokhov. They swear by him. He has made a subject of invitation, as though he were a sterlet, said Shinshin. Dolokhov and Anatole Kuragin have turned the heads of all our young ladies. Just then into the next box came a tall, handsome lady with a tremendous plate of hair and a great display of plump white shoulders and neck, around which she wore a double string of large pearls. She was a long time in settling herself with a great rustling of her stiff silk dress. Natasha found herself involuntarily gazing at that neck, those shoulders and pearls, and that headdress, and she was amazed at their beauty. Just as Natasha was taking a second look at her, the lady glanced round, and, fixing her eyes on Count Ilya Andreyitch, nodded her head and smiled. It was Countess Buzakaya, Pierre's wife. Ilya Andreyitch, who knew everyone in society, leaned over and spoke with her. "'Have you been here long, Countess?' he inquired. "'I'm coming in. I'm coming in soon to kiss your hand. 
I'm in town on business, and have got my girls with me. They say Semyonova plays her part superbly, said Ilya Andreyitch. I hope Count Pyotr Kirillovich has not entirely forgotten us. Is he here? Yes, he was intending to come, said Ellen, and she gave Natasha a scrutinizing look. Count Ilya Andreyitch again sat back in his place. Isn't she pretty, though? asked he of Natasha. A perfect marvel, replied the latter. I could understand falling in love with her. By this time the last notes of the overture were heard, and the baton of the Kapellmeister rapped upon the stand. Those gentlemen who were in late slipped down to their places, and the curtain rose. As soon as the curtain went up, silence reigned in the parterre, and in the boxes, and all the gentlemen, young and old, whether in uniform or in civilian's dress, and all the ladies, with precious stones glittering on their bare bosoms, with eager expectation, turned their attention to the stage. Natasha also tried to look. End of chapter 8part five chapter nine of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter nine smooth boards formed the centre of the stage on the sides stood painted canvases representing trees in the background a cloth was stretched out on boards in the foreground girls in red bodices and white petticoats were sitting around one who was exceedingly stout wore a white silk dress she sat by herself on a low footstool to the back of which was glued green cardboard they were all singing something after they had finished their chorus the girl in white advanced toward the prompter's box and a man in silk tights on his stout legs and with a feather and a dagger joined her and began to sing and wave his arms the man in the tights sang alone then she sang then they were both silent the orchestra played, and the man began to turn down the fingers on the girl's hand, evidently waiting for the beat, when they should begin to sing their parts together. They sang a duet, and then all in the audience began to clap and to shout, and the man and the woman on the stage, who had been representing lovers, got up, smiling and letting go of hands, and bowed in all directions. After her country life, and the serious frame of mind into which Natasha had lately fallen, all this seemed to her wild and strange she was unable to follow the thread of the opera and it was only as much as she could do to listen to the music she saw only painted canvas and oddly dressed men and women going through strange motions talking and singing in a blaze of light she knew what all this was meant to represent but it all struck her as so affected unnatural and absurd that some of the time she felt ashamed for the actors and again she felt like laughing at them she looked around at the faces of the spectators to see if she could detect in them any of this feeling of ridicule and perplexity which she felt but all these faces were absorbed in what was taking place on the stage or as it seemed to natasha expressed a hypocritical enthusiasm this must be i suppose very lifelike said natasha she kept gazing now at those rows of pomaded heads in the parterre then at the half-naked women in the boxes and most of all at her neighbor ellen who as undressed as she could well be gazed with a faint smile of satisfaction at the stage not dropping her eyes conscious of the brilliant light that overflowed the auditorium and the warm atmosphere heated by the throng natasha gradually began to enter into a state of intoxication which she had not experienced for a long time she had no idea who she was or where she was or of what was going on before her she gazed and let her thoughts wander at will and the strangest most disconnected ideas flashed unexpectedly through her mind now she felt inclined to leap upon the edge of the box and sing the aria which the actress had just been singing then she felt an impulse to tap with her fan a little old man who was sitting not far off then again to lean over to ellen and tickle her at one time when there was perfect silence on the stage just before the beginning of an aria the door that led into the parterre, near where the Rostovs were seated, creaked on its hinges, and a man who came in late was heard passing down to his seat. "'There goes Kuragin,' whispered Shinshin. The Countess Buzakaya turned her head and smiled at the newcomer. Natasha followed the direction of the Countess Buzakaya's eyes, and saw an extraordinarily handsome adjutant, who, with an air of extreme self-confidence, 
but at the same time of good breeding, was just passing by their box. This was Anatole Kuragin, whom she had seen and noticed some time before at a ball in Petersburg. He now wore his adjutant's uniform, with epaulette and shoulder knot. He advanced with a supreme air of youthful gallantry, which would have been ludicrous had he not been so handsome, and had his handsome face not worn such an expression of cordial good humor and merriment. Although it was during the act, he sauntered along the carpeted corridor, slightly jingling his spurs and holding his perfumed, graceful head on high with easy grace. Glancing at Natasha, he joined his sister, laid his exquisitely gloved hand on the edge of her box, nodded to her, and bent over to ask some questions in reference to Natasha. Mais charmante, said he, evidently referring to her. She understood less from hearing his words than from the motion of his lips. Then he went forward to the front row and took his seat near Dolokhov, giving him a friendly, careless nudge with his elbow, though the others treated him with such worshipful consideration. The other, with a merry lifting of the eyebrows, gave him a smile and put up his foot against the railing. "'How like brother and sister are,' said the Count, "'and how handsome they both are!' Shinshin, in an undertone, began to tell the Count some story about Kurigan's intrigues in Moscow, to which Natasha listened simply because he had spoken of her as charmant. The first act was over. All in the parterre got up, mingled together, and began to go and come. Boris came to the Rostovs' box, received their congratulations very simply, and, smiling abstractedly and raising his brows, invited Natasha and Sonya, on behalf of his betrothed, to be present at their wedding, and then left them. Natasha, with a bright, coquettish smile, had talked with him and congratulated him on his engagement, although it was the same Boris with whom she had been in love only a short time before. This, in her intoxicated, excited state, seemed to her perfectly simple and natural. The bare-bosomed Ellen sat near her, and showered her smiles indiscriminately on all, and in exactly the same way Natasha smiled on Boris. Ellen's box was crowded by the most influential and witty men of the city, who also gathered around the front of it, on the parterre side, vying with each other, apparently, in their desire to let it be known that they were acquainted with her. Kuragin, throughout the entire entre-acte, stood with Lopukov, with his back to the stage, in the very front row, and kept his eyes fixed on the Rostovs' box. Natasha felt certain that he was talking about her, and it afforded her gratification. She even turned her head slightly, in a way which, in her opinion, best showed off the beauty of her profile. Before the beginning of the second act, Pierre, whom the Rostovs had not seen since their arrival, made his appearance. His face wore an expression of sadness, and he was stouter than when Natasha had last seen him. Without recognizing anyone, he passed down to the front row. Anatole joined him and began to make some remark looking and pointing to the Rostov's box. A flash of animation passed over Pierre's face as he caught sight of Natasha, and he hastily made his way across through the seats to where she was. Then, leaning his elbows on the edge of her box, he had a long conversation with her. While she was talking with Pierre, she heard a man's voice in the Countess Buzakoya's box, and something told her that it was Anatole Kurigan. She glanced round, and their eyes met. She almost smiled, and he looked straight into her eyes with such an admiring, tender gaze that it seemed to her strange to be so near him, to see him, to be so sure that she pleased him, and yet not to be acquainted with him. In the second act the stage represented a cemetery, and there was a hole in the canvas which represented the moon, and the footlights were turned down, and the horns and contrabasses began to play in very deep tones, and the stage was invaded from both sides by a throng of men in black mantles. These men began to wave their arms, brandishing what seemed to be daggers. Then some other men rushed forward, and proceeded to drag away by main force that damsel who, in the previous act, had been dressed in white, but was now in a blue dress. Before they dragged her away, they sang with her for a long time, and at the sound of three thumps on something metallic behind the scenes, all fell on their knees and began to sing a prayer. A number of times all these actions were interrupted by the enthusiastic plaudits of the spectators. Every time during this act that Natasha looked down into the parterre, she saw Anatole Kurigan with his arm carelessly thrown across the back of his seat, gazing at her. 
it was pleasant for her to feel that she had so captivated him and it never entered into her head that in all this there was anything improper when the second act was over the countess buzakaya stood up leaned over to the rostofs box thereby exposing her whole bosom beckoned the old count to come to her and then paying no heed to those who came to her box to pay her their homage she began a smiling confidential conversation with him you must certainly make me acquainted with your charming girls said she the whole city are talking about them and i don't know them natasha got up and made a curtsey to this magnificent countess the flattery of this brilliant beauty was so intoxicating to her that she blushed with pleasure and gratification i mean to be a muscovite also said ellen and aren't you ashamed of yourself to hide such pearls in the country the countess buzakoya by good rights had the reputation of being a fascinating woman she could say the opposite of what she thought and could flatter in the most simple and natural manner now my dear count you must allow me to see something of your daughter though i don't expect to be here very long you don't either i believe i shall try to make them have a good time i hear a good deal about you in petersburg and i wanted to make your acquaintance said she turning to natasha with her stereotyped bewitching smile i heard about you from my page drubetskoy have you heard by the way that he was engaged and from my husband's friend bolkonsky prince andrei bolkonsky said she with an especial emphasis signifying thereby that she knew of his relations toward natasha then she proposed that in order to become better acquainted one of the young ladies should come over into her box for the rest of the performance and natasha went during the third act the scenes represented a palace wherein many candles were blazing while on the walls hung paintings representing full bearded knights in the centre stood apparently a czar and tsaritsa the czar was gesticulating with his right hand and after singing something with evident timidity and certainly very wretchedly he took his seat on a crimson throne the damsel who had at first been dressed in white and then in blue was now in nothing but a shift with dishevelled hair and stood near the throne she was warbling some doleful ditty addressed to the tsaritsa but the tsar peremptorily waved his hand and from the side scenes came a number of bare-legged men and bare-legged women and began to dance all together then the fiddles played a very dainty and merry tune one girl with big bare legs and thin arms coming out from among the others went behind the scenes and having adjusted her corsage came into the centre of the stage and began to caper around and knock her feet together the whole parterre clapped their hands and shouted bravo then a man took his stand in one corner the orchestra played louder than ever with a clanging of cymbals and blare of horns and this bare-legged man alone by himself began to make very high jumps and kick his feet together this man was duport who earned sixty thousand roubles a year by his art all in the parterre in the boxes and in the upper paradise began to thump and shout with all their might and the man paused and smiled and bowed to all sides then some others danced bare-legged men and women then one of the royal personages shouted something with musical accompaniment and all began to sing but suddenly a storm arose chromatic scales and diminished sevenths were heard in the orchestra and all scattered behind the scenes carrying off with them again one of those who was present and the curtain fell once more among the audience arose a terrible roar and tumult and all with enthusiastic faces shouted at once duport 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 natasha no longer looked upon this as strange or unusual with a sense of satisfaction she looked around her smiling joyously ne sais pas qu'il est admirable duport asked ellen turning to her oh oui replied natasha end of chapter nine part five chapter ten of war in peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter ten during the entr'acte a draught of cold air made its way into ellen's box as the door was opened and anatole came in bowing and trying not to disturb any one allow me to present my brother said ellen uneasily glancing from natasha to anatole natasha turned her pretty graceful head toward the handsome young man and smiled at him over her shoulder 
anatole who was as fine-looking near at hand as he was at a distance sat down by her and said that he had been long wishing for the pleasure of her acquaintance ever since that Narushkin's ball where he had seen her and never forgotten her kuragin was far cleverer and less affected with women than he was in the society of men he spoke fluently and simply and natasha had a strange and agreeable feeling of ease in the company of this man about whom so many rumours were current he was not only not terrible but his face even wore a naive jolly and good-natured smile kuragin asked her how she enjoyed the play and told her how semyovnova at the last performance had gotten a fall while on the stage do you know countess said he suddenly addressing her as though she were an old acquaintance we have been arranging a fancy dress party you ought to take part in it it will be very jolly we shall all rendezvous at the kerrigan's please come won't you he insisted in saying this he did not once take his smiling eyes from her face her neck her naked arms natasha was not left in doubt of the fact that he admired her this was agreeable but somehow she felt constrained and troubled by his presence when she was not looking at him she was conscious that he was staring at her shoulders and she involuntarily tried to catch his eyes so that he might rather fix them on her face but while she thus looked him in the eyes she had a terrified consciousness that that barrier of modesty which she had always felt before kept other men at a distance was down between him and her without being in the least able to explain it she was conscious within five minutes that she was on a dangerously intimate footing with this man she nervously turned a little for fear he might put his hand on her bare arm or kiss her on the neck they talked about the simplest matters and yet she felt that they were more intimate than she had ever been with any other man she looked at ellen and at her father as though asking them what all this meant but ellen was busily engaged in conversation with some general and paid no heed to her imploring look and her father's said nothing more to her than what it always said happy well i am glad of it during one of those moments of constraint while anatole's prominent eyes were calmly and boldly surveying her natasha in order to break the silence asked him how he liked moscow natasha asked the question and blushed it seemed to her all the time that she was doing something unbecoming in talking with him anatole smiled as though to encourage her at first i was not particularly charmed with moscow because what a city ought to have to be agreeable is pretty women isn't that so well now i like it very much said he giving her a significant look will you come to our party countess please do said he and stretching out his hand toward her bouquet and lowering his voice he added in french you will be the prettiest come my dear countess and as a pledge give me that flower natasha did not realize what he was saying any more than he did but she had a consciousness that in his incomprehensible words there was an improper meaning she knew not what reply to make and turned away pretending not to have heard him but the instant that she turned away the thought came to her that he was there behind her and so near what is he doing now is he ashamed of himself is he angry is it my business to make amends she asked herself she could not refrain from glancing round she looked straight into his eyes and his nearness and self-possession and the good-natured warmth of his smile overcame her she gave him an answering smile and gazed straight into his eyes and once more she realized with the feeling of horror that there was no barrier between them the curtain again went up anatole left the box calm and serene natasha rejoined her father in her own box but already she was under the dominion of this world into which she had entered everything that passed before her eyes now seemed to her perfectly natural while all her former thoughts concerning her lover and the princess maria and her life in the country vanished from her mind as though all that had taken place long long ago in the fourth act there was a strange kind of devil who sang and gesticulated until a trap beneath him was opened and he disappeared this was all that natasha noticed during the fourth act something agitated and disturbed her and the cause of this annoyance was kuragin at whom she could not help looking when they left the theatre anatole joined them summoned their carriage and helped them to get seated as he was assisting natasha he squeezed her arm above the elbow startled and blushing she looked at him his brilliant eyes returned her gaze and he gave her a tender smile 
not until she reached home was natasha able clearly to realize all that had taken place and when she suddenly remembered prince andrei she was horror-struck and as they all sat drinking tea she groaned aloud and flushing scarlet ran from the room my god i am lost she said to herself how could i have let it go so far she wondered long she sat hiding her flushed face in her hands striving to give herself a clear account of what had happened to her and she could not do so nor could she explain her feelings everything seemed to her dark obscure and terrible then in that huge brilliant auditorium where duport with his bare legs and spangled jacket capered about on the dampened stage to the sounds of music and the girls and the old men and ellen much decolleté with her charm and haughty smile were all applauding and enthusiastically shouting bravo there under the protection of this same ellen everything was perfectly clear and simple but now alone by herself it became incomprehensible what does it mean what means this fear that i experience in his presence what means these stings of conscience which i experience now she asked herself if only her mother had been there natasha would have made confession of all her thoughts before going to bed that night she knew that sonya with her strict and wholesome views would either entirely fail to understand or would be horrified by her confession natasha accordingly tried by her own unaided efforts to settle the question that tormented her have i really forfeited prince andrei's love or not she asked herself and then with a reassuring smile she replied to her own question what a fool i am to ask this what is the sense of it none i have done nothing i was not to blame for this no one will know about it and i shall not see him any more she said to herself of course it is evident no harm has been done there is nothing to repent of and no reason why prince andrei should not love me just as i am but what do i mean by just as i am oh my god my god why is he not here natasha grew calm for an instant but then some instinct told her that even though nothing had happened and no harm had been done still the first purity of her love for prince andrei was destroyed and once more she let her imagination bring up her whole conversation with kuragin and she recalled his face and his motions and the tender smile that this handsome impudent man had given her after he had squeezed her arm End of chapter ten Part five, chapter eleven of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter eleven. Anatole Kuragin was living in Moscow because his father had sent him from Petersburg, where he had been spending more than twenty thousand rubles a year and had accumulated heavy debts as well, which his creditors were trying to obtain from his father his father explained to him that he would for the last time pay one half of his debts but only on condition of his going to moscow as adjutant to the governor-general of the city an appointment which he obtained for him he advised him to make up his mind at last to try to win the hand of some rich heiress he suggested the princess maria or julie karagina anatole consented and went to moscow where he took up his residence at pierre's at first pierre received him with scant welcome but at length he became accustomed to him and occasionally accompanied him on his sprees and under the pretense of a loan gave him money anatole as shinshin correctly stated the case had instantly turned the heads of all the girls in moscow and particularly by the fact of his affected neglect of them and his avowed preference for gypsy girls and french actresses with the leading light of whom mademoiselle georges it was said he was on terms of close intimacy he never failed of a single drinking bout given by Danilov or the other fast men of Moscow. He could drink steadily from night till morning, out drinking everyone else. Moreover, he was a constant habitué of all the balls and receptions in the upper circles of society. Rumors were rife of various intrigues of his with married ladies in Moscow, and at the balls he always paid particular court to several. But from young ladies, particularly those who were rich and in the marriage market, most of whom were excessively plain, Anatole kept at a respectful distance, and this arose from the fact, known only to a very few of his most intimate friends, that he had been married two years before. Two years before, while his regiment had been cantoned in Poland, 
a Polish proprietor of a small estate had forced Anatole to marry his daughter. Anatole had soon after abandoned his wife, and, by engaging to send money periodically, he persuaded his father-in-law to let him pass still as a bachelor. Anatole was always satisfied with his situation, with himself, and with other people. He was instinctively, by his whole nature, convinced that it was entirely impossible for him to lead another manner of existence, and that he had never in his life done anything wrong. He was in no condition to ponder on the effect that his behavior might have on others, or what might be the result of his behaving in this, that, or the other way. He was persuaded that, just as the duck was so created as always to be in the water, in the same way he was created by God for the purpose of living with an income of thirty thousand roubles a year, and of occupying the highest pinnacle of society. He was so firmly grounded in this opinion, that other people also, when he saw them, shared in his conviction, and never thought of refusing him either the foremost place in society, or the money which he took of any one he met, without ever thinking of repaying it. He was no gambler, at least, he never showed sordid love for gain. He was not ostentatious. It was absolutely a matter of indifference to him what men thought of him. Still less was he open to the charge of ambition. Many times he had annoyed his father by injuring his own prospects, and he always made sport of dignities. He was not stingy, and he never refused any one who asked a favor of him. All that he cared for was a good time, and women, and, as, according to his opinion, there was nothing ignoble in these tastes, and he could not calculate the consequence for other people of the gratification of these tastes of his, he therefore considered himself irreproachable sincerely scorned ordinary scoundrels and base men, and held his head high with a tranquil conscience. Debauchees, those male Magdalens, have a secret feeling of blamelessness, such as is peculiar to the frail sisterhood, and it is based in the same hope of forgiveness. She shall be forgiven much, for she hath loved much, and he shall be forgiven much, because he hath enjoyed much." Dolokhov, back again in Moscow, after his exile and his adventures in Persia, and once more leading a dissipated and luxurious life, and playing high, naturally became intimate with his old Petersburg companion, Kuragin, and made use of him for his own ends. Anatole really liked Dolokhov for his wit, intelligence, and audacity. Dolokhov, who found the name, the notability, and the connections of Anatole Kuragin an admirable decoy for attracting rich young fellows into his clutches, made use of him, and got enjoyment out of him without letting him suspect it. Besides the financial purpose for which Anatole served him, the act itself of controlling the will of another was an enjoyment, a habit, a necessity for Dolokhov. Natasha had made a deep impression on Kuragin. At supper after the opera, with all the enthusiasm of a connoisseur, he praised to Dolokhov her arms, her shoulders, her feet, and her hair, and he expressed his intention of making love to her. The possible consequences of such love-making Anatole did not stop to consider, nor was it in him to foresee them any more than in any other of his escapades. "'Yes, she's pretty, my dear fellow, but she's not for us,' said Dolokhov. "'I'm going to tell my sister to invite her to dinner. How's that?' suggested Anatole. "'You had better wait till she's married.' "'You know,' said Anatole. "'Je dois les petites filles. You can turn their heads so quick.' "'You have already fallen into the hands of one petite filet,' said Dolokhov, who knew about Anatole's marriage. "'See?' "'Well, can't get caught a second time, eh?' replied Anatole, good-naturedly laughing. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 12 The next day the Rostovs stayed at home, and no one came to see them. Marya Dmitrievna had a confidential conversation with her father, taking pains to keep it secret from Natasha, who nevertheless suspected that they were discussing the old prince and concocting some scheme. It disquieted and humiliated her. She was every moment expecting Prince Andrei to come, and twice that day she sent the Dvornik to the Balkonskys to learn if he had arrived, but he was still absent. It was now more trying to her than during the first days of his absence. Her impatience and melancholy thoughts about him were intensified by an unpleasant recollection of her interview with the Princess Maria, and the scene with the old prince, 
as well as by a vague and undefinable fear and uneasiness. She had a notion that either he would not come at all, or that before he came something would happen. She found it impossible, as before, to have calm and collected thoughts about him when alone by herself. As soon as her thoughts turned to him, her recollections of him were confused by recollections of the old prince, of the Princess Maria, of the operatic performance, and of Kurrigan. Again the question arose whether she was not to blame, whether her troth plighted to Prince Andrei was not already broken, and again she would picture to herself, even to the most trifling details, every word, every gesture, every slightest shadow in the play of expression on the face of that man who had succeeded in arousing in her such a terrible and inexplicable feeling. In the eyes of the home circle, Natasha seemed livelier than usual, but she was far from being as calm and happy as she had been before. On Sunday morning, Maria Dmitrievna proposed to her guests to attend Mass at the parish chapel of Uspeni Namohiltsak. "'I don't like these fashionable churches,' said she, evidently priding herself on her independence. "'God is everywhere, one. We have an excellent pope, and deacon as well, and the service is well performed. What kind of worship is it to have concerts given in the choir? I don't like it. It's mischievous nonsense.' Maria Dmitrievna liked Sundays, and had them kept as high festivals. Her house was thoroughly washed and cleaned on Saturday. Neither she nor the people within her gates did any work. They wore their best clothes, and all went to Mass. On Sunday she had prepared an extra fine dinner, and her servants were provided with vodka and a roasted goose or a suckling pig. But nothing in the whole house gave more decided evidence of its being a holiday than Maria Dmitrievna's broad, stern face, which on this occasion wore an unchangeable expression of solemn festivity. After Mass, while they were drinking their coffee in the drawing-room, where the furniture covers had been removed, a servant announced to Maria Dmitrievna that the carriage was at the door. She drew a long face and, putting on her best shawl, in which she always paid visits, got up and announced that she was going to see Prince Nikolai Andreevich Bokonsky to have an understanding with him in regard to Natasha. After Maria Dmitrievna had taken her departure, a modiste from Madame Chalmes came to try on the young lady's new dresses, and Natasha, retiring to the next room and shutting the door, was very glad of the diversion. Just as she had put on a hastily basted and still sleeveless waist, and was standing in front of the mirror, bending her head around to see how the back fitted, she heard in the drawing-room the lively tones of her father's voice, mingled with those of a woman, and it made her blush. It was Ellen's voice. Natasha had not time to take off the experimental waist before the door opened, and into the room came the Countess Buzakaya, beaming with a good-natured and flattering smile, and wearing a dark purple velvet dress with a high collar. "'Ah, Medelicieuse!" she exclaimed to the blushing Natasha. "'Charmant! No, she is quite unlike anyone else, my dear Count,' said she, turning to the Count who followed her in. "'The idea of living in Moscow and not going anywhere!' no i shall not let you off this evening mademoiselle georges is going to recite for me and we shall have a crowd and if you don't bring your beauties who are far better than mademoiselle georges i shall never forgive you my husband is away he has gone to Tver. otherwise i should send him for you do not fail to come don't fail at ten o'clock she nodded to the dressmaker whom she knew and received a most respectful curtsey and then sat down in an armchair near the mirror, picturesquely disposing the folds of her velvet dress. She did not cease to chatter with good-natured and merry volubility, constantly saying pleasant, flattering things about Natasha's beauty. She examined her dresses and praised them, also managed to say a good word for a new dress of her own, en gauze métallique, metallic gauze, which she had just received from Paris, and advised Natasha to get one like it. "'Besides, it would be extremely becoming to you, my charmer,' said she. Natasha's face fairly beamed with pleasure. She felt happy and exhilarated by the praise of this gracious Countess Buzokoya, who had heretofore seemed to her such an inaccessible grand lady, and was now so cordial toward her. Natasha's spirits rose, and she felt almost in love with this woman, who was so beautiful and so good-natured. Ellen, on her part, was sincerely enchanted by Natasha, and wanted her to have a good time. Anatole had urged her to help on his acquaintance with her, and it was for this purpose that she had called on the Rostovs. The idea of helping her brother in such a flirtation was amusing to her. 
although that winter in petersburg she had felt a grudge against natasha for alienating boris from her it had now entirely passed from her mind and with all her heart she felt kindly disposed toward natasha as she was taking her departure she called her protege aside last evening my brother dined with me we almost died of laughing he eats just nothing at all and can only sigh for you my charmer il est fou mais fou amoureux de vous ma chère natasha flushed crimson on hearing these words how she blushes how she blushes ma delicieuse pursued ellen don't fail to come even if you are in love that is no reason for making a nun of yourself even if you are engaged i am sure that your future husband would prefer to have you go into society rather than die of tedium in his absence of course she knows that i am engaged of course she and her husband she and pierre that good honest pierre have talked and laughed about this of course there is no harm in it and again under ellen's influence all that hitherto seemed terrible to her seemed simple and natural and she is such a grande dame and so kind and she seems to like me so heartily said natasha to herself and why shouldn't i have a good time queried natasha looking at ellen with wide eyes full of amazement marya Dmitrievna returned in time for dinner silent and solemn having evidently suffered a rebuff at the old prince's she was still laboring under too much excitement from her encounter to be able to give a calm account of it to the count's question she replied that everything would be all right and she would tell him about it the next day when she was informed of the count buzukaya's visit and the invitation for the evening she said i don't like the idea of your going to the buzukaya's and i should advise you not to however if you have already promised go perhaps you will have some amusement she added addressing natasha End of chapter 12part five chapter thirteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter thirteen count ilya andreitch took his young ladies to the countess buzakaya's the reception was fairly well attended but the most of the company were strangers to natasha count ilya andreitch saw with dissatisfaction that the larger majority of those present consisted of men and women noted for their free and easy behavior mademoiselle georges stood in one corner of the drawing-room surrounded by young men there were a number of frenchmen and among them mitivier who since ellen's arrival had become an intimate at her house count ilya andreitch decided not to take a hand at the card-table or to leave the girls but to take his departure as soon as mademoiselle georges had finished her recitation anatole was at the door evidently on the lookout for the rostovs as soon as he had exchanged greetings with the count he joined natasha and followed her into the room the moment she saw him she was assailed just as she had been at the theatre by a mixed sense of gratified vanity that she pleased him and of fear because of the absence of moral barriers between him and her ellen received natasha effusively and was loud in praise of her beauty and her toilette soon after their arrival mademoiselle georges retired from the room to change her costume in the meantime chairs were disposed in the drawing-room and the guests began to take their seats anatole procured a chair for natasha and he was just going to sit next to her but the count keeping sharp eye on his daughter took the seat next to her anatole sat behind mademoiselle georges with plump and dimpled arms all bare and with a red shawl flung across one shoulder came out into the space around which the chairs were ranged and assumed an unnatural pose a murmur of admiration was heard mademoiselle georges threw a stern and gloomy glance around and began to recite certain lines in french in which the guilty love of a mother for her son is delineated in places she raised her voice then again she spoke in a whisper triumphantly tossing her head and in other places she broke short off or spoke in deep hoarse tones rolling her eyes adorable divine de la sue were the acomiums heard on all sides natasha's eyes were fastened on the stout actress but she heard nothing saw nothing understood nothing of what was going on before her she felt that she was irrevocably drawn again into that strange mad world so far removed from the past world where it was impossible to know what was right and what was wrong what was reasonable and what was foolish 
behind her sat anatole and she was conscious of his nearness and with terror awaited some development after the first monologue the whole company arose and crowded around mademoiselle georges expressing their delight and enthusiasm how beautiful she is said natasha to her father who had got up with the rest and was starting to push his way through the throng toward the actress i cannot think so when i look at you said anatole sitting down next to natasha he spoke so that no one else could hear what he said you are charming since the first moment that i saw you i have not ceased come let us go natasha interrupted the count returning to his daughter how pretty she is natasha making no reply followed her father but gave anatole a look of wondering amazement after several more recitations mademoiselle georges took her departure and the countess buzakaya invited her guests into the ballroom the count wanted to go home but ellen begged him not to spoil her improvised ball the rostovs remained anatole took natasha out for a valse and while they were on the floor and he clasped her waist and hand he told her that she was revisante and that he loved her during the ecoles which she danced with kuragin also anatole said nothing to her while they were by themselves but merely gazed at her natasha was in doubt whether she had not dreamed what he said to her during the valse at the end of the first figure he again pressed her hand natasha lifted startled eyes to his but his look and his smile had such an expression of self-confidence and flattering tenderness that she found it impossible to look at him and say to him what was on her tongue to say she dropped her eyes do not say such things to me i am betrothed i love another she hurriedly whispered she glanced at him anatole was not in the least confused or chagrined at what she had said don't speak to me about that what difference does it make to me he asked i tell you i am madly madly in love with you am i to blame because you are bewitching it's our turn to lead natasha excited and anxious looked around with wide frightened eyes and gave the impression of being gayer than usual she remembered almost nothing of what took place that evening while they were dancing the ecoles and the grossvater her father came and urged her to go home with him but she begged to stay a little longer wherever she was whomever engaged her in conversation she was conscious all the time of his eyes upon her afterwards she remembered asking her father's permission to go to the dressing-room to adjust her dress and how ellen followed her and told her with a laugh that her brother was in love with her she remembered how in the little divan room she had again met anatole how ellen had suddenly disappeared leaving her alone with him and how anatole seizing her hand had said in a tender voice i cannot call upon you but must i never see you i love you madly desperately can i not see you and then blocking her way he had bent down his face close to her face his great gleaming masculine eyes were so near to her face that she could see nothing else except those eyes of his nathalie she heard his voice whisper with a questioning inflection and her hand was squeezed almost painfully nathalie i do not understand at all i have nothing to say said her glance his glowing lips approached her lips but at that instant she felt that her deliverance had come for the sound of ellen's footstep and the rustle of her dress were heard in the room natasha glanced at ellen then blushing and trembling she gave him a terrified questioning look and started for the door un mot un seul un nom de dieu said anatole she paused she felt that it was necessary for her to hear that single word which would afford her an explanation of what had happened and allow her something tangible to answer nathalie un mot un seul he kept repeating evidently not knowing what to say and he repeated it until ellen came close to him ellen and natasha returned together to the drawing-room declining the invitation to stay to supper the rostovs went home that night natasha could not sleep at all she was tormented by the question which she could not answer which she loved anatole or prince andrei she loved prince andrei she had a very distinct remembrance of how warmly she loved him but she loved anatole also there could be no doubt about that otherwise how could all of this have taken place she asked herself if it was possible for me on saying good-bye to him to answer his smiles with smiles if i could permit myself to go so far then of course i was in love with him at first sight he certainly is good and noble and handsome and it is impossible not to be in love with him what can i do when i love him 
and love the other too she asked herself and found no solution to the vexing problem end of chapter thirteen Part Five, Chapter Fourteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Fourteen. Morning came with its usual occupations and bustle. All arose, stirred about, engaged in talk. Once more the modiste came. Again Maria Dmitrievna appeared and summoned them down to tea. Natasha, with wide-opened eyes, as though trying to anticipate and intercept every glance fixed upon her, looked anxiously about, and struggled to seem the same as usual. After breakfast, which was her favorite time, Marya Dmitrievna sat down in her easy-chair, and called Natasha and the old count to her. Well, with strong emphasis on the word, well, my friends, now I have thought the whole matter over, and this is my advice, she began yesterday as you know i went to see prince nikolai well again with strong emphasis i had an interview with him he thought to shout me down but i am not to be shouted down so easily i had it all out with him well what did he do asked the count what did he do he's a raving maniac won't listen to anything well what's the use of talking and, meanwhile, we are tormenting this poor girl so, said Marya Dmitrievna. And my advice to you is to transact your business and go home, to Otradnoye, and there wait till— Oh, no! cried Natasha. Yes, you must go, maintained Marya Dmitrievna, and wait there. If your betrothed should come here now, there would infallibly be a quarrel. But if he is here alone with the old man, they will talk the whole thing over calmly, and then he will come for you. Ilya Andreyitch approved of this plan, which instantly appealed to his good judgment. If the old prince was appeased, then they could rejoin him at Moscow or Louisa Gurie. If not, as it would be contrary to his wishes, then the wedding could take place at Otranoya. "'That is true as gospel,' said he. "'Only I am sorry that I went there and took her,' said the old count. "'There is nothing to be sorry for. As long as you were here you couldn't help paying him that mark of respect.' well if he does not approve it is his affair said marya dmitrievna making search for something in her reticule besides the trousseau is all ready so what have you to wait for and what isn't ready i will send to you indeed i am sorry about it but you would be much better off to return and god be with you having succeeded in finding what she was searching for she handed it to natasha it was a letter from the princess marya she's written to you how she torments herself poor soul she is afraid you will imagine that she does not like you. Well, and she doesn't like me, said Natasha. Nonsense! Don't say such a thing, cried Marya Dmitrievna. I take no one's opinion. I know she does not like me, said Natasha boldly, snatching the letter, and her face assumed such an expression of hard and angry determination that it caused Marya Dmitrievna to look at her more closely and frown. Don't you contradict me that way, Matushka, said she what i tell you is the truth go and reply to her letter natasha made no rejoinder and retired to her own room to read the princess maria's letter the princess wrote that she was in despair owing to the misunderstanding that had arisen between them whatever were her father's feelings she wrote she besought natasha to be assured that it was impossible for her not to love her as the choice of her brother for whose happiness she was ready to sacrifice everything moreover she wrote do not imagine that my father was unkindly disposed toward you he is old and feeble and you must excuse him but he is good and generous and will not fail to love the one who can make his son happy the princess further asked natasha to appoint a time when they could have another meeting after reading the letter through natasha sat down at the writing-desk to pen a reply cher princess she wrote hastily and mechanically and paused what more could she write after all that had taken place the evening before. Yes, yes, all that is past, and now, already, everything is different, she said to herself, as she pondered over the letter that refused to be written. Ought I to reject him? Is it really my duty? It is frightful. And, to escape from these terrible thoughts, she went to Sonya, and began to help her pick out her embroidery patterns. 
after dinner natasha again retired to her room and took up the princess maria's letter can it be that all is really over between us she mused can it be that this has happened so quickly and that all that is past is completely annihilated she recalled in all its intensity her love for prince andre and yet at the same time she felt that she was in love with kuragin she vividly pictured herself as prince andre's wife and recalled those dreams of happiness with him which she had so many times enjoyed in imagination and at the same time fired with passionate emotions she recalled every detail of her last meeting with anatol why could it be possible to love them both at once she more than once asked herself in the depths of perplexity then only could i be perfectly happy but now i must choose and i cannot be happy to be deprived of either of them one thing is certain she thought to tell prince andrei what has happened or to hide it from him is impossible but as far as he is concerned no harm has been done can i break off for ever though with that delicious love for prince andrei to whom my life has been devoted so long barushnya said the maid in a whisper and coming into the room with a mysterious face a nice little man told me to give you this the maid handed her a note only for christ's sake she exclaimed as natasha without thinking mechanically broke the seal and began to read it was a love letter from anatole and while she did not comprehend a word of it she comprehended enough to know that it was from him from the man she loved yes she loved him how else could happen what had happened how could she have in her hand a love letter from him with trembling hands natasha held this passionate love letter composed for anatol by dolokhof and in reading it she found it contained what corresponded to everything which it seemed to her she herself felt last evening decided my fate you must love me or i die i have no other alternative so the letter began then he proceeded to say that he knew her parents would not consent to her marriage to him for various secret reasons which he could reveal to her alone but that if she loved him it was enough for her to say the little word yes and no mortal power could suffice to destroy their bliss love conquers all he would spirit her away and fly with her to the ends of the earth yes yes i love him mused natasha as she read the letter over for the twentieth time and tried to discover some peculiarly deep meaning in every word that evening marya dmitrievna was going to the arkharovs and she invited the young ladies to accompany her natasha under the pretext of a headache remained at home end of chapter fourteen Part Five, Chapter Fifteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Fifteen. Sonya, on her return late that evening, went to Natasha's room and, to her amazement, found her still dressed and asleep on the sofa. On the table near her lay Anatole's letter, wide open. Sonya picked the letter up and proceeded to read it she read it through and gazed at the sleeping natasha trying to discover in her face some key to the mystery of what she had read and finding none the expression of natasha's face was calm and sweet and happy sonya pale and trembling with fright and emotion clutching her breast lest she should choke sat down in an easy chair and melted into tears how is it i have seen nothing of this how can this have gone so far is it possible she has ceased to love prince andre and how can she tolerate this kuragin he is a deceiver and a scoundrel that is evident what will nicholas do dear noble nicholas when he learns of this so this is what caused her agitation and unnatural behaviour for the last three days said sonya to herself but it is impossible that she is in love with him most likely she opened the letter without knowing from whom it came in all probability she was offended she couldn't have done such a thing knowingly sonya wiped away her tears and went close to natasha and scrutinized her face natasha she murmured almost inaudibly natasha awoke and looked at sonya ah are you back already and in the impulse of the sudden awakening she gave her friend a warm and affectionate hug but instantly noticing that sonya's face was troubled her face also became troubled and suspicious sonya 
"'Have you been reading that letter?' she asked. "'Yes,' murmured Sonya. Natasha smiled triumphantly. "'No, Sonya, it is impossible to hold out any longer,' said she. "'I cannot hide it from you any more. "'You know, we love each other. "'Sonya, my darling, he has written me. "'Sonya!' Sonya, not believing her own ears, stared at Natasha with open eyes. "'But Volkonsky!' she exclaimed. "'Ugh, Sonya! Ugh! If you could know how happy I am!' cried Natasha. "'You can't imagine what such love is!' "'But, Natasha, do you mean to say that the other is all at an end?' Natasha gazed at Sonya with wide-open eyes, as though she did not understand her question. "'What?' "'Have you broken with Prince Andrei? demanded Sonya. "'Ugh! You can't comprehend it. Don't talk nonsense. Listen to me,' said Natasha, with a flash of ill-temper. "'No, I cannot believe this,' insisted Sonya. "'I cannot understand it. How can you have loved one man a whole year, and then suddenly—why, you have only seen him three times. Natasha, I don't believe you. You are joking. In three days to forget everything?' And so, three days, interrupted Natasha, it seems to me as if I had loved him for a hundred years. It seems to me as if I had never loved anyone else before him. You cannot comprehend it. Sonya, wait, sit down. Natasha threw her arms around her and kissed her. I have been told, and you have probably heard, that such love as this existed. But now for the first time I experience it. It is not like the one before— the moment I set eyes on him, I felt that he was my master, that I was his slave, and that I could not help loving him. Yes, his slave. Whatever he commands me, I obey him. You can't understand that. What can I do? What can I do, Sonya? pleaded Natasha, with a happy, frightened face. But just think what you are doing, insisted Sonya. I cannot let this go on, this clandestine correspondence— "'How could you permit him to go so far?' asked she, with a horror and aversion which she had tried in vain to hide. "'I have told you,' replied Natasha, "'that I have no will about it. Why can't you understand? I love him.' "'Then I will not let it go any farther. I shall tell the whole story,' cried Sonya, with a burst of tears. "'For God's sake, I beg of you. If you tell, you are not my friend,' exclaimed Natasha." Do you wish me to be unhappy? Do you wish to separate us? Seeing how passionately excited Natasha was, Sonya shed tears of shame and regret for her friend. But what has passed between you? she asked. What has he said to you? Why doesn't he come to the house? Natasha made no reply to this question. For God's sake, Sonya, don't tell anyone. Don't torment me, entreated Natasha. Remember, it's never right to interfere in such matters— I have trusted you. But why all this secrecy? Why doesn't he come to the house? insisted Sonya. Why doesn't he openly ask for your hand? You know Prince Andre gave you absolute freedom, if such were the case. But I don't believe in this man. Natasha, have you considered what his secret reasons may be? Natasha gazed at Sonya with wondering eyes. Evidently this question had not occurred to her before, and she knew not what answer to make. "'What reasons? I don't know. But of course there must be reasons.' Sonya sighed and shook her head incredulously. "'If there were reasons,' she began, but Natasha, foreseeing her objections, with frightened eagerness interrupted her. "'Sonya, it is impossible to doubt him. Impossible! Wholly impossible! Don't you understand?' she cried. "'Does he love you?' "'Love me!' repeated Natasha, with a smile of contemptuous pity for her friend's incredulity. "'You have read his letter. You have seen him, haven't you?' "'But if he were a dishonorable man—' "'He? A dishonorable man? If you knew him!' exclaimed Natasha. "'If he were an honorable man, then he ought either to explain his intentions or else cease to see you. And if you are not willing to do this, then I shall. I shall write him—' "'I shall tell your papa,' said Sonya, decidedly. "'But I can't live without him,' cried Natasha. "'Natasha, I don't understand you. "'What are you saying? "'Think of your father. "'Think of Nicholas. "'I want no one. "'I love no one but him. 
how do you dare to assert that he is dishonourable don't you know that i love him cried natasha sonya go i don't wish to quarrel with you go away for god's sake go away you see how tormented i am screamed natasha in a voice of repressed anger and despair sonya began to sob and rushed from the room natasha went to her writing-table and without pausing a moment wrote the letter to the princess maria which she had not been able to write the morning before in the letter she laconically informed the princess that all misunderstandings were at an end that taking advantage of prince andrei's generosity and giving her perfect freedom she begged her to forget all that had happened and to forgive her if she had been to blame in respect to her but that she could never be his wife at that moment all seemed to her so easy simple and clear the rostofs were to start for the country on friday and on wednesday the count went with an intending purchaser to his pod moskovnaya estate on the day of the count's trip sonya and natasha were invited to a great dinner at the kuragins and marya dmitrievna went as their chaperone at this dinner natasha again met anatol and sonya observed that natasha had some mysterious conversation with him which she evidently wished not to be overheard and during all the dinner time she seemed to be more agitated than ever on their return home natasha was the first to begin the explanation which her friend was anxious for there sonya you have said all sorts of foolish things about him natasha began in a cajoling tone such as children use when they want to be flattered he and i came to a clear understanding to-day now what do you mean what did he say natasha how glad i am that you are not vexed with me tell me all tell me the whole story what did he say to you natasha pondered ach sonya if you only knew him as i do he said he asked me what sort of an engagement i had with bolkonsky he was delighted that it depended on me to break it off sonya sighed mournfully but you haven't broken your engagement with bolkonsky have you well perhaps i have broken my engagement with bolkonsky perhaps it is all at an end what makes you have such hard thoughts of me i have no hard thoughts of you only i can't understand this wait sonya and you will understand the whole thing you will learn what a man he is but don't harbour hard thoughts of me or of him either i harbour no hard thoughts of any one i love you and i am sorry for you all but what am i to do sonya however was not blinded by the affectionate manner in which natasha treated her the more gentle and insinuating natasha's face grew the more stern and serious became sonya's face natasha said she you yourself begged me not to say any more about this to you and i have not and now you reopen it yourself natasha i don't have any faith in him why all this mystery there you begin again interposed natasha natasha i am afraid for you why should you be afraid for me i am afraid that you are going to your ruin said sonya in a resolute voice frightened herself at what she said an angry look again came into natasha's face i will go to my ruin i certainly will and the faster the better it's no affair of yours it won't hurt you even if it does hurt me leave me leave i hate you natasha expostulated sonya in dismay i hate you i hate you we can never be friends any more natasha rushed out of the room natasha had nothing more to say to sonya and she avoided her with that peculiar expression of nervous preoccupation and guilt she wandered up and down the rooms trying one occupation after another and instantly abandoning them hard as this was for sonya she did not let her out of her sight for a single moment but followed her everywhere she went on the day before the count's return sonya observed that natasha spent the whole morning at the parlor window as though in expectation of some one and that she made some sort of signal to an officer who drove by and who sonya thought must have been anatole sonya began to observe her friend still more closely and remarked that during all dinner-time and throughout the evening natasha was in a strange and unnatural state of excitement answering at random the questions that were asked her beginning and not finishing sentences and laughing at everything after tea sonya saw a timid chambermaid watching for her at natasha's door she let her pass in and listening at the keyhole discovered that she was the bearer of another letter and suddenly it became clear to sonya that natasha had some terrible plan on foot for that evening sonya knocked loudly at the door natasha refused to admit her 
She is going to elope with him, said Sonya to herself. She is quite ready for anything. Her face today had a peculiarly pitiful and determined expression. She wept when she said goodbye to her father yesterday, Sonya remembered. Yes, it is evident that she is going to elope with him. What can I do about it? mused Sonya, now recalling all the circumstances that made her think Natasha had adopted some terrible resolution. The Count is away. What can I do? Write to Kurigan and demand of him an explanation. But who would make him reply to it? Write to Pierre, as Prince Andre told me to do in case of misfortune. But perhaps she has already broken with Volkonsky. Certainly Natasha sent her letter to the princess last evening. If her father were only here! It seemed terrible to tell Marya Dmitrievna, who had such confidence in Natasha. But what else can I do? mused Sonya, as she stood in the dark corridor. Now or never is the time to show that I am grateful to this dear family, and that I love Nicholas. No, even if I have to stay awake for three nights I will not leave this corridor, and I will detain her by main force, and I will not allow any scandal to happen to this family, she said to herself. End of chapter 15part five chapter sixteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole the slippervox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter sixteen anatole had recently transferred his lodgings to dolokhov's house the plan of abducting the young countess had been suggested and arranged by dolokhov some days before and on that day when sonya listening at natasha's door had determined to protect her this scheme was already to be carried into execution. Natasha had agreed to meet Kuragin at ten o'clock that evening at the rear entrance. Kuragin was to place her in a trioka, which should be in waiting, and carry her sixty versts to the village of Kamienko, where an unfrocked pope would be in readiness to perform the mock marriage ceremony. At Kamienko, a relay would be ready to take them toward Warsaw, and thence by regular stages they would make their escape abroad. Anatole had his passport, and his Fedoroznoya, or order for post-horses, and ten thousand roubles obtained from his sister, and ten thousand obtained through Dolokhov's mediation. Two witnesses, Vostokov, formerly a law clerk who is now a creature of Dolokhov's, and Makarin, a hussar on the retired list, a weak and good-natured fellow who had an inordinate affection for Kurigan, were sitting in the front room over their tea. In Dolokhov's large cabinet, the walls of which were hung from floor to ceiling with Persian rugs, bearskins, and weapons, sat Dolokhov himself in a travelling bishmet and top-boots before an open desk, on which lay bills and packages of money. Anatole, in his uniform, unbuttoned, came in from the room where the two witnesses were sitting, and was passing through the cabinet into the adjoining room where his French valet and another servant were packing up the last remaining effects. Dolokhov was making out the accounts and writing the amounts on a sheet of paper. Well, said he, you will have to give two thousand to Vostokov. All right, give it to him, said Anatole. Makarka, this was an affectionate name for Makarin, is so disinterested that he would go through fire and water for you. There now, the accounts are all made out, said Dolokhov, calling his attention to the paper. Is that right? Yes, of course it is said Anatole, evidently not heeding what was said, and looking into vacancy with a dreamy expression and a smile that did not leave his face. Dolokhov shut the desk with a slam, and turned to Kurigin with an amused smile. "'But see here, now. You'd better give this up. There's still time,' said he. "'Fool! Durak!' said Anatole. "'Stop talking nonsense. If you only knew. But only the devil knows what this is to me. Honestly!' "'Throw it up,' said Dolokhov. "'I tell you the honest truth. "'Do you imagine that this is a joke that you are going into?' "'There you are, stirring me up again. "'Go to the devil!' exclaimed Anatole, scowling. "'I have no time to listen to your idiotic twaddle.' "'And he started to leave the room. "'Dolokhov smiled scornfully and condescendingly as Anatole turned away. "'Wait!' he cried after him. "'I am not joking. "'I am telling you the truth. "'Come here.' "'Come here, I say.' Anatole came back into the room again, and, trying to concentrate his attention, gazed at Dolokhov, apparently quite under the influence of his will. "'Listen to me. 
I suspect for the last time. Why should I jest with you? Have I done anything to thwart you? Who is it that has made all the arrangements for you? Who found your pope for you? Who procured your passport? Who got the money for you? Haven't I done the whole thing? Yes, and I thank you. Do you imagine I'm not grateful? Anatole sighed and embraced his friend. I have been helping you, but it is my place to tell you the truth. It is a dangerous game, and if it misses fire, a stupid one. Suppose you elope with her. Well and good. What will be the next step? It will be discovered that you are married. You will be prosecuted as a criminal. Ugh, what nonsense! What stupid nonsense! cried Anatole, frowning again. Haven't I told you again and again, eh? And Anatole, with that peculiar passion for argument characteristic of men of small intellects, when they want to show their wit, reiterated the considerations which he had laid before Dolokhov a hundred times. I have told you again and again. My mind is made up. If this marriage is invalid, said he, doubling over his finger, of course I am not responsible for it. Well, then, suppose it is valid. It's just the same, and when we are abroad, no one will know the difference. That's a fact, is it not? Say no more. Say no more. Say no more. But really, give it up. You will only get yourself into a scrape. Go to the devil, screamed Anatole, and, tearing his hair, he rushed into the next room, and then he came right back and sat down a straddle of a chair in front of Dolokhov. The devil only knows what this is to me, eh? Just see how it beats. He took Dolokhov's hand and put it on his heart. Ah, quel pied, mon cher, quel regard, un dies, eh? Dolokhov, smiling unsympathetically, looked at him out of his handsome, impudent eyes, evidently feeling inclined to have a little more sport out of him. Well, but when your money is gone, what then? What then? Eh? repeated Anatole, with a touch of genuine distress at the thought of the future. What then? I am sure I don't know. But what is the use of talking nonsense? He looked at his watch. It's time. Anatole went into the next room. Hurry up there. Aren't you almost ready? What are you dawdling so for? He cried, addressing the servants. Dolokhov put up the money, and, shouting to his man to have a lunch of eatables and drinkables prepared for the travellers for their journey, he went into the room where Vostokov and Makarin were waiting. Anatole had flung himself down on the ottoman in the cabinet, and, with his head resting on his hand, was dreamily smiling and whispering low and tender words. "'Come and have something to eat. Have a drink, then,' cried Dolokhov from the next room. "'I don't wish anything,' replied Anatole still with the smile on his handsome lips. Come, Balaga is here. Anatole got up and went into the dining room. Balaga was a famous Trioka driver who, for half a dozen years, had known Dolokhov and Anatole and had furnished them with teams. More than once, when Anatole's regiment had been at Tver, he had started at nightfall from Tver, set him down in Moscow before daybreak, and brought him back by the following morning. More than once he had taken Dolokhov out of the reach of pursuers. More than once he had taken them out to drive with gypsies and demochki, nice little dames, as Balaga called fast women. More than once, at their instigation, he had run down pedestrians and izvoschcheks in the Moscow streets, and always his gentlemen, as he called them, had rescued him from the penalty. More than one horse he had broken down in their service. More than once he had been thrashed by them, Many times they had given him champagne and Madeira, which he specially affected, and he knew of escapades of theirs which would have condemned any ordinary man to Siberia. During their orgies, they had often invited Balaga to take part, and made him drink and dance with the gypsies, and more than one thousand roubles of theirs had passed through his hands. In service for them, he had twenty times a year risked life and limb, and in accompanying their deviltry he had almost killed more horses than their money would ever pay for. But he was fond of them. He was fond of that mad pace of eighteen verse an hour. He was fond of upsetting some harmless Ivoschek from his box, or running down some pedestrian on the street crossings, and of dashing at full tilt down the Moscow highways. He was fond of hearing behind him that wild cry of drunken voices, Pachol, Pachol! 
when it was already a physical impossibility for his horses to carry them a step further and he was fond of winding his whiplash around a peasant's neck who shrank back more dead than alive as he passed by real gentlemen he called them anatol and dolokhov also were fond of balaga because of his masterly skill in handling the lines and because his tastes were similar to theirs with others he drove hard bargains charging twenty-five roubles for two hours outing and he rarely condescended to drive others himself but more frequently sent one of his subordinates but with his gentlemen as he called them he always went himself and never charged for his extra labor only when he learned through the valets that money was plentiful he would come after an interval of many months and very soberly and obsequiously bowing low asked to be helped out of his difficulties his gentlemen always made him take a seat you will excuse me bayushka fyodor ivanuitch or your illustriousness he would say i am entirely out of horses i pray you to advance me enough to go and get more at the yermanka and anatol and dolokhov if they happened to be flush of funds would give him a thousand or so roubles balaga was twenty-seven years old a stubbed red-haired snub-nosed muzik with fiery red complexion and still more fiery red neck with glittering little eyes and a scrubby beard he wore a fine blue silk-lined kaftan and over that a sheepskin polushupka he crossed himself turning to the shrine corner as he came in and advanced toward dolokhov holding out a small black hand fyodor ivanovitch your good health he exclaimed with a low bow how are you brother there he is good health your illustriousness said he addressing anatol who came in at that moment and offered him also his dirty hand i ask you balaga said anatol clapping his hand on his shoulder do you love me or not eh now there's a chance for you to prove it what horses have you come with eh those your man ordered your own wild ones said balaga now see here balaga no matter if you slaughter all three of your horses provided you get us there within three hours eh if we slaughter them how shall we get there replied balaga with a wink i'll smash your snout for you a truce to joking cried anatol suddenly with glaring eyes who's joking exclaimed the driver with a laugh do i ever grudge anything for my gentlemen whatever my horses can show in the way of speed that we will do ah grunted anatol sit down then yes why not sit down said dolokhov i will stand fyodor ivanovitch sit down no nonsense have a drink said anatol and poured him out a great glass of madeira the driver's eyes flashed at the sight of the wine refusing at first for manners sake he drank it down and wiped his mouth with a red silk handkerchief which he kept in the top of his cap well when shall we start your illustriousness let me see anatol glanced at his watch start pretty soon now see here balaga hey you will get there on time well it depends on the start if we get off luckily then we'll be there in good time i got you to tver once went there in seven hours don't you remember your illustriousness do you know when christmas we started from tver said anatol smiling at the remembrance and turning to makarin who was gazing affectionately at kuragin with all his eyes you wouldn't believe it makarka we flew so that it quite took away my breath we came upon one file of carts and jumped right over two of them eh what horses those were interposed balaga taking up the thread of the story at that time i put in two young side horses with the bay shaft horse said he turning to dolokhov you would hardly believe it fyodor ivanuitch those wild creatures actually flew for sixty verse it was impossible to hold them my hands were numb it was so cold i threw down the lines look out for yourself your illustriousness said i and rolled over backward into the sledge it was hopeless to control em or even to stick to my seat the devils got us there in three hours only the left one was winded End of chapter sixteen Part five, chapter seventeen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter seventeen. Anatole left the room and at the end of a few minutes came back in a sable shubka 
girded with a silver buckled leather belt and wearing a sable cap jauntily set on one side and very becoming to his handsome face glancing into the mirror and then taking the same posture before dolokhof which the mirror had told him was the most effective he seized a glass of wine well fedya good-bye prashkai thank you for everything prashkai said anatole well comrades friends he pondered a moment friends of my youth prashkait he said turning to makarin and the others although they were all going with him anatole evidently wanted to do something affecting and solemn on the occasion of this farewell he spoke in a low slow deep voice and throwing out his chest he swayed a little as he rested his weight on one leg all of you take your glasses you too balaga well comrades friends of my youth we have had jolly good times together we have enjoyed life we have been on many sprees eh now when shall we meet again i am going abroad farewell prashkai my boys to your health hurrah he cried draining his glass and smashing it on the ground to your good health exclaimed balaga also draining his glass and wiping it with his handkerchief makarin with tears in his eyes embraced anatole ugh prince how sad that we should have to part he exclaimed come let us be off cried anatole balaga was on the point of leaving the room hold on there wait said anatole shut the door we must sit down first there that's the way they closed the door and sat down for the sake of the superstition well now be off with you boys said anatole getting up anatole's valet joseph gave him his purse and sabre and all flocked into the anteroom but where is the shuba demanded dolokhof hey ignatka go to matryona matryevna and ask her for the shuba the sable cloak i know how girls go off on such occasions exclaimed dolokhof with a wink she will come running out more dead than alive dressed for staying in the house and if you delay a moment too long there will be tears and o papasha and o mamasha and she'll be cold and back she'll go so be sure you take this shuba with you and have it all ready in the sledge the valet brought a woman's cloak lined with fox you fool i told you to get the sable hey matryoshka bring the sable he shouted his voice ringing down through the rooms a handsome gypsy girl though thin and pale with brilliant black eyes and curly purplish black hair with a red shawl over her shoulders came hurrying out with the sable cloak over her arm why i don't care take it said she evidently afraid of her master and yet regretting the cloak dolokhof without heeding her took the foxskin shuba threw it over matryosha and wrapped it round her so said dolokhof and so he repeated as he pulled the collar up above her head leaving only a small opening for her face that's the way do you see and he moved anatole's head towards the opening left by the collar where matryosha's brilliant smile could alone be seen well good-bye matryosha prushkai said anatole kissing her ech my follies here are ended give my regards to stioshka well prushkai matryoshka wish me good luck well then prince god grant you the best of luck said matryosha in her gypsy accent at the doorstep two triokas were waiting with two jaunty yamshchiks in attendance balaga was on the box of the first sledge and with his elbows held high was deliberately sorting the reins anatole and dolokhof got in behind him makarin vostokov and the valet took their places in the other trioka all ready inquired balaga let her go he cried twisting the reins round his wrists and the three horses flew like the wind down the nikitsky boulevard the groom leaped down to hold the horses heads by the curb while anatole and dolokhof strode along the pavement coming to the gate dolokhof gave a low whistle the whistle was returned and immediately after a chambermaid came running out come into the court else you will be seen she'll be down presently said she dolokhof remained by the gate anatole followed the chambermaid into the dvor turned the corner and ran up the steps suddenly gavrilo marya dmitrievna's colossal footman met anatole be good enough to go to my mistress said the footman in a deep bass voice as he blocked all retreat from the door 
who's your mistress who are you demanded anatole in a breathless whisper if you please i was ordered to show you kurgan back cried dolokhof you are betrayed back dolokhof who had been left at the outside gate was engaged in a tussle with the dvornik who was trying to shut it and prevent anatole from returning through it dolokhof with a final output of force overturned the dvornik seized anatole by the arm pulled him through the gate and ran together with him back to their trioka end of chapter seventeen Part Five, Chapter Eighteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Marya Dmitrievna, finding the weeping Sonya in the corridor, had obliged her to confess the whole. Having got possession of Natasha's letter and read it, Marya Dmitrievna took it and confronted Natasha with it. Wretched girl, shameless hussy, she said to her. I will not listen to a single word. Pushing away Natasha, who looked at her with wondering but tearless eyes, she shut her in under lock and key. Then she had ordered the Dvornik to admit into the courtyard anyone who might come that evening, but not to let them out again, and she had ordered the footmen to show such persons into her presence. Having made these arrangements, she took up her position in the drawing-room and waited for developments. When Gavrilo came in to inform Marya Dmitrievna that the abductors had escaped, she was very indignant. She got up, and for a long time paced up and down the room, with her hands clasped behind her back, deliberating on what she ought to do. At midnight she got the key out from her pocket and went into Natasha's room. Sonya was still sitting in the corridor, sobbing. "'Marya Dmitrievna, let me go to her, for God's sake,' said she. Marya Dmitrievna, giving her no reply, opened the door and went in. "'Disgusting! Abominable!' in my house indecent shameless hussy only i'm sorry for her father said marya dmitrievna trying to master her indignation hard as it will be i will bid them all hold their tongues and i'll keep it from the count marya dmitrievna entered the chamber with her firm step natasha was lying on the sofa with her face hid in her hands she did not stir but lay in the same position in which marya dmitrievna had left her pretty conduct pretty conduct indeed exclaimed marya dmitrievna to make assignations with your lovers in my house none of your hypocrisy listen when i speak to you marya dmitrievna shook her by the arm listen when i speak to you you have disgraced yourself like any common wench i'd settle this with you but i have some pity for your father i shall keep it from him natasha did not change her position but her whole body began to shake with the noiseless convulsive sobs that choked her marya dmitrievna glanced at sonya and sat down on the sofa near natasha lucky for him he escaped me but i'll find him said she in her harsh voice do you hear what i am saying she put her big hand under natasha's face and turned it toward her both marya dmitrievna and sonya were amazed when they saw her face her eyes were dry and glittering her lips compressed her cheeks hollow. Let me be. What do I care? I shall die, she murmured, turning away from Marya Dmitrievna with angry petulance and hiding her face in her hands again. Natalia, exclaimed Marya Dmitrievna, I wish you well. Lie there, lie there if you wish, I won't touch you. But listen to me. I am not going to show you how blameworthy you have been. You know. But, don't you see, your father will be back tomorrow. What shall I say to him? Again Natasha's form was shaken by sobs. He will hear of it, and so will your brother, and so will your betrothed. I have no betrothed. I have refused him, cried Natasha. That is immaterial, pursued Marya Dmitrievna. Well, they will learn of it. Do you think they will forgive it? there's your father i know him if he should challenge him would it be a good thing ha huh? ach leave me why should you have interfered at all why why who asked you to screamed natasha sitting up straight on the sofa and glaring angrily at marya dmitrievna but what idea had you demanded marya dmitrievna 
again losing her patience. Were you kept locked up? Who on earth prevented him from coming to the house? Why must he needs carry you off like a gypsy wench? Well, now, suppose he had carried you off. Do you suppose we shouldn't have found him? Either your father, or your brother, or your betrothed? Well, he's a scoundrel, a knave, that's what he is. He's better than all of you put together, cried Natasha, sitting up very straight. If you had not meddled, ugh, oh, my God, has it come to this? Has it come to this? Sonya, what made you? Go away! And she burst into a passion of tears, sobbing with the desperation such as only those feel who know that they are responsible for their own woes. Marya Dmitrievna began to speak once more, but Natasha cried, Go away! Go away! You all hate me! You all despise me! And she threw herself on the sofa again. Marya Dmitrievna continued for some time to give her advice, and assure her that this whole affair ought to be kept a secret from the Count, that no one would know anything about it, if only Natasha would try to let it all go, and not betray in any one's presence that anything had happened. Natasha made no reply. She ceased to sob, but a fit of shivering and trembling came upon her. Marya Dmitrievna put a pillow under her head, covered her up with a couple of comforters, and herself brought her some linden flower, but Natasha had nothing to say to her. Now, let her go to sleep, said Marya Dmitrievna, and left the room, thinking that she would soon sleep. But Natasha did not go to sleep, and with wide, staring eyes, gazed into vacancy. She slept none that night, and she did not weep, and she did not speak to Sonya, who several times got up and went to her. On the following day, Count Ilya Andreyitch returned from his Podmoskovnaya in time for breakfast as he had promised. He was in a most genial frame of mind. He had come to a satisfactory arrangement with his purchaser, and now there was nothing to detain him in Moscow, and away from his countess, whom he was very anxious to see. Marya Dmitrievna met him, and informed him that Natasha had been ill the day before, that they had sent for the doctor, and now she was better. Natasha that morning did not leave her room. With set, cracked lips, with wide, dry eyes, she kept her place by the window, and anxiously gazed at the passers-by in the street, and turned anxiously towards those who entered her room. She was evidently expecting news from him, expecting that either he would himself come or send her a letter. When the Count went to her, she heard the sound of his heavy steps, and turned round nervously, and then her face assumed its former expression of hauteur, and even anger. She did not even get up to meet him. "'What is the matter with thee, my angel? Are you ill?' asked the Count. Natasha hesitated. "'Yes, I am ill,' said she. In reply to the Count's anxious questions, why she was so cast down, and whether anything had happened to her lover, she assured him that nothing had happened, and begged him not to be disturbed. Marya Dmitrievna confirmed Natasha's statement that nothing had happened, but the Count, judging from the imaginary illness, and by his daughter's absent-mindedness, by the troubled faces of Sonya and Marya Dmitrievna, saw clearly that during his absence something must have happened. It was so terrible, however, for him to think that anything disgraceful had happened to his beloved daughter. He was so happy in his buoyant good spirits that he avoided asking any pointed questions, and tried hard to assure himself that nothing out of the way could have happened. And his only regret was that, on account of Natasha's indisposition, he was obliged to postpone their return to his country seat. End of chapter 18part five chapter nineteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter nineteen pierre on the day of his wife's arrival at moscow had made up his mind to take a journey somewhere so as to avoid being with her then when the rostovs came to moscow the impression produced upon him by natasha made him hasten to carry out his intention he went to Tver to see Iosip Alexievich's widow, who had some time since promised to put into his hands her husband's papers. On Pierre's return to Moscow, a letter was handed him from Marya Dmitrievna, who urged him to come and consult with her on some highly important business concerning Andrei Bolkonsky and his betrothed. Pierre had avoided Natasha. 
it seemed to him that he felt for her a sentiment stronger than was justifiable for a married man to harbour for his friend's mistress and some perverse fate was constantly throwing them together what can have happened and what can it have to do with me he wondered while dressing to go to marya dmitrievna's it is high time for prince andrei to be back and marry her thought pierre as he set out for mrs akrasimova's on the tversky boulevard someone hailed him pierre been back long cried a well-known voice pierre raised his head it was anatole and his inseparable companion Magarin, dashing by in a double sledge drawn by two grey trotters that sent the snow flinging over the dasher anatole sat bolt upright in the classic pose of dashing warriors with his neck muffled in a beaver collar and bending his head a little his face was fresh and ruddy his hat with a white plume was set jauntily on one side exposing his curled and pomaded hair dusted with fine snow indeed he's a real philosopher thought pierre he sees nothing beyond the enjoyment of the actual moment nothing annoys him and consequently he is always jolly self-satisfied and calm what would i give to be like him thought pierre with a feeling of envy in the anteroom of the akrasimovas a footman who relieved pierre of his shuba told him that marya dmitrievna would receive him in her own room as he passed through the music-room pierre caught sight of natasha sitting by the window with a strange expression of disdain on her pale thin face she gave him a glance and frowned and with an expression of chilling dignity left the room what has happened asked pierre on entering marya dmitrievna's room pretty state of affairs replied marya dmitrievna fifty-eight years i have lived in this world and i never saw anything so shameful and then receiving pierre's word of honour that he would keep secret what he should hear marya dmitrievna confided to him that natasha had broken her engagement with prince andrei without the knowledge of her parents that the cause of this break was anatole kuragin whom pierre's wife had introduced to her and with whom she had promised to elope during her father's absence in order to enter into a clandestine marriage pierre with shoulders raised and mouth opened listened to marya dmitrievna's story not believing his own ears that prince andrei's betrothed that hitherto lovely natasha rostova so passionately beloved should give up bolkonsky for that fool of an anatole who was a married man for pierre was in the secret of his marriage and so be enamoured of him as to consent to elope with him pierre could not comprehend and could not imagine natasha's sweetness of character he had known her since childhood could not in his mind be associated with this new suggestion of baseness folly and cruelty in her he remembered his own wife they are all alike he said to himself thinking that he was not the only one who had had the misfortune to be in the toils of an unworthy woman and at the same time he could have wept for his friend prince andrei to whose pride it would be such a grievous blow and the more he grieved for his friend the greater scorn and even aversion he felt for natasha who had just passed by him with such an expression of haughty dignity in the music-room he could not know that natasha's soul was full to overflowing of despair shame and humiliation and that she was not to blame for her face expressing from very despair that cold dignity and disdain but how could he marry her exclaimed pierre catching at marya dmitrievna's last word he could not marry her he already has a wife worse and worse exclaimed marya dmitrievna fine young man what a dastard he is and she has been waiting here these two days for him to come at any rate she must cease expecting him we must tell her when she learned from pierre all the details of anatole's marriage and had poured out the vials of her wrath against him in abusive words marya dmitrievna explained to pierre why she had asked him to call upon her she was afraid that the count or bolkonsky who was liable to return at any moment might learn of the affair in spite of all her efforts to keep it a profound secret and might challenge kuragin to a duel and therefore she besought him to add his influence to hers in getting him to leave town and never show himself in her presence again pierre willingly agreed to fulfil her wishes since now he for the first time realized the danger threatening the old count and nikolai and prince andrei having preferred her request in short and precise terms she took him back into the drawing-room mind you the count knows nothing of this 
you must pretend that you also know nothing about it said she and i am going this instant to tell her that she is to cease expecting him and stay to dinner if you will shouted back maria dmitrievna to pierre pierre met the old count he was disturbed and annoyed that morning natasha had told him that she had broken her engagement with bolkonsky too bad too bad mon cher said he to pierre too bad for these girls to be away from their mother how sorry i am that i ever came at all i am going to be frank with you she has already broken her engagement without telling any one of us about it now i will admit that i never have been over pleased at this engagement i will agree that he is a fine man and all that but what would you have there would not be much happiness if the father was opposed and natasha would not lack chances of getting married still the affair has gone on so long and to have such a step taken without consulting father or mother and now she's sick and god knows what's the matter it's a bad thing count a bad thing for daughters to be without their mother pierre perceived that the count was very much disconcerted and he tried to bring the conversation round to other topics but the count kept returning to his grievance sonya with anxious face came into the drawing-room natasha is not very well to-day she is in her room but she would like to see you marya dmitrievna is with her and would also like you to come yes certainly you and bolkonsky were good friends she probably wants to send some message said the count ugh oh, my god my god how good it all was and tearing at his thin locks the count left the room marya dmitrievna had been explaining to natasha how anatole was married natasha refused to believe her and demanded to have confirmation of it from pierre himself sonya confided this to pierre as they passed along the corridor toward natasha's room natasha pale and stern was sitting next to marya dmitrievna the moment pierre entered the doorway she met him with feverishly glittering wildly imploring eyes she did not smile she did not even greet him with a nod she only looked at him eagerly and her eyes merely demanded if he came as her friend or like all the rest as her enemy in reference to anatole pierre in his own personality as pierre did not exist for her he knows all about it said marya dmitrievna indicating pierre and addressing natasha let him tell you if i am not speaking the truth natasha as a wounded animal at bay glares at the dogs and huntsmen approaching looked first at the one and then at the other natalia ilyanichna pierre began dropping his eyes and experiencing a feeling of compunction for her and of aversion to the operation which he was obliged to perform it is true whether this is true or not true as far as you are concerned it cannot matter because then it is not true that he is married nay it is true has he been married for some time she asked on your word of honour pierre gave her his solemn word of honour is he still in town she asked hurriedly yes i have just seen him the effort to say more was evidently too much for her and she made them a sign with her hand to leave her alone end of chapter nineteen Part Five, Chapter Twenty of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twenty. Pierre did not remain for dinner, but immediately took his leave. He went out for the purpose of finding Anatole Kuragin, the mere thought of whom now made all the blood rush to his heart and almost choke him. He sought him everywhere: at the ice hills, among the gypsies, at Komenyos but he was nowhere to be found pierre went to the club there everything was going in its usual train the members who were assembling for dinner formed little groups and greeting pierre spoke of various items of city gossip a servant who knew his habits and his particular friends accosted him politely and informed him that the place was ready for him at the little table that prince n n was in the library but that t t had not yet come one of pierre's acquaintances during some talk of the weather asked him if he had heard of kuragin's elopement with rostova about which the whole city were talking and if it were true pierre with a laugh said that it was all nonsense because he had just come from the rostovs he inquired of every one if they had seen anatole one said that he had not yet come another that he would be there to dinner 
it was strange for pierre to look at this tranquil indifferent throng of men who had not the slightest inkling of what was passing in his mind he then sauntered through the hall till all had gone in to dinner and then giving up expecting anatol he did not wait for dinner but went home anatol whom he was so anxious to find dined that day with dolokhof and was discussing with him some plan of still carrying out their ill-fated enterprise it seemed to him absolutely necessary to have an interview with natasha in the evening he went to his sister's in order to arrange with her some means of procuring this interview when pierre who had vainly ransacked all moscow returned home the footman informed him that prince anatol vasilyitch was with the countess the countess's drawing-room was crowded with company pierre not even greeting his wife whom he had not seen since his return never had she seemed to him more utterly detestable than at that moment went into the drawing-room and catching sight of anatol went straight up to him ah pierre cried the countess approaching her husband you don't know in what a position our anatol she paused when she saw the forward thrust of her husband's head in his flashing eyes and his resolute gait the same strange terrible expression of frenzy and might which she had known and experienced after his duel with dolokhof sin and lewdness are with you everywhere said pierre to his wife anatol come with me i want a few words with you he said in french anatol glanced at his sister and boldly rose ready to follow pierre pierre took him by the arm and hurried him out of the room si vous vous permettez dans mon salon exclaimed ellen in a whisper but pierre made no reply and left the room anatol followed him with his usual jaunty gait but there was a trace of anxiety on his face when they reached pierre's cabinet he shut the door and addressed anatol without looking at him you promised to marry the countess rostova and planned to elope with her my dear replied anatol in french in which language indeed the whole conversation was carried on i consider myself under no obligation to answer questions asked in such a tone pierre's face white to begin with became perfectly distorted with rage with his huge hand he seized anatol by the collar of his uniform coat and proceeded to shake him from side to side until the young man's face expressed a sufficient degree of terror when i tell you that i must have an answer from you now look here this is stupid ha exclaimed anatol looking for the button that had been torn off from his collar you are a scoundrel and a blackguard and i don't know what restrains me from the satisfaction of smashing your head with this said pierre expressing himself with easy fluency because he spoke in french he had taken into his hand a heavy paperweight and he held it up menacingly and then slowly laid it back in its place again did you promise to marry her i i i don't think so besides i couldn't have promised any such thing be because pierre interrupted him have you any of her letters he demanded coming close to him anatol gave him one look and instantly put his hand into his pocket and took out a pocket-book pierre seized the letter which he handed to him and violently pushing aside a chair that was in his way he went to the sofa and flung himself upon it i will not hurt you have no fear said he in reply to anatol's terrified gesture the letters one thing said pierre as though repeating a lesson for his own edification secondly he continued after a moment's silence getting to his feet again and beginning to pace up and down the room you must leave moscow to-morrow but how can i thirdly pursued pierre not heeding him you must never breathe a word about what has taken place between you and the countess this i know i cannot oblige you to do but if you have a single spark of conscience pierre walked in silence several times from one end of the room to the other anatol had sat down by the table and was scowling and chewing his lips you must learn some time that above and beyond your own pleasure the happiness and peace of others are to be considered that you are ruining a whole life for the sake of having a little amusement trifle with women like my wife as much as you please with such you have fair game they know what you want of them they are armed against you by their very experience in lust but promise a young girl to marry her to deceive her to rob her why don't you know that it is as cowardly as to strike an old man or a child pierre stopped speaking and looked at anatol inquiringly his anger had vanished 
i don't know i'm sure huh said anatole gaining confidence in proportion as pierre's anger subsided i know nothing about it and i don't want to know said he not looking at pierre while at the same time his lower jaw trembled slightly but you have spoken to me words so insulting that i as a man of honour cannot think of permitting them pierre looked at him in amazement perfectly unable to understand what he wanted of him though we have had no witnesses continued anatole still i cannot what you wish satisfaction asked pierre scornfully at least you can retract what you said eh that is if you expect me to carry out your wishes eh i will i'll take it back exclaimed pierre and i beg you to forgive me pierre could not help looking at the torn button and money if you need it for your journey anatole smiled this contemptible villainous smile which he knew so well in his wife stirred pierre's indignation oh contemptible heartless race he exclaimed and left the room the next day anatole started for petersburg end of chapter twenty Part Five, Chapter Twenty One of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twenty One. Pierre went to Maria Dmitrievna's to inform her how he had accomplished her wishes in regard to Anatole's expulsion from Moscow. He found the whole house in terror and commotion. Natasha was very ill, and as Maria Dmitrievna informed him under a seal of secrecy the night after she had learned that anatole kuragin was married she had poisoned herself with arsenic that she managed surreptitiously to procure having swallowed a considerable quantity she awakened sonya and confessed what she had done the proper antidotes to the poison had been given in time and she was now out of danger but she was still so weak that it was out of the question to think of taking her to the country and the countess had been sent for pierre saw the troubled count and the weeping sonya but he was not allowed to see natasha Pierre had that day dined at the club, and had heard on all sides gossip about the frustrated elopement, but he strenuously denied these rumours, assuring every one that there was nothing in it, except that his brother-in-law had offered himself to Rostova, and had been refused. It seemed plain to Pierre that it was his bounden duty to conceal the whole affair, and save Natasha's reputation. In a real panic he waited for Prince Andrei's return, and each day he went to the old prince's to inquire for news of him. Prince Nikolai Andreyitch had learned through Mademoiselle Burine of all this gossip flying through the city, and he had read the letter to the Princess Maria, in which Natasha broke off her engagement with Prince Andrei. This letter also he had obtained through Mademoiselle Burine, who had fetched it from the princess. He seemed in better spirits than usual, and awaited his son's return with the greatest impatience. When the latter finally reached Moscow, the old prince first thing handed him Natasha's letter to his sister, announcing her discontinuance of the engagement and told him with additions of his own invention the various rumours current concerning the elopement a few days after anatole's departure pierre received a note from prince andrei announcing his arrival and begging pierre to come to see him since prince andrei's arrival had been in the evening pierre went to see him the following morning he expected to find him in almost the same state of mind as natasha was and therefore great was his amazement when on being shown into the drawing-room he heard prince andrei in the adjoining cabinet telling in a loud animated manner of some petersburg intrigue he was occasionally interrupted by the old prince and by a third person present the princess maria came in to greet pierre she sighed as she turned her eyes towards the door of the room where her brother was evidently anxious to give expression to her sympathy for his affliction but pierre detected on her face evidences of her inward gratification at the turn affairs had taken and at the manner in which her brother had received the news of natasha's fickleness he told me that he expected this said she i know that his pride would not let him make any show of his feelings but nevertheless he bears up under it better far better than i had any reason to expect of course since it had to be so but do you mean to say it is all over between them the princess maria looked at him in amazement she could not understand how any one should even ask such a question pierre went into the cabinet prince andrei much altered and evidently restored to perfect health but with a new and perpendicular wrinkle between his brows was standing in civil dress in front of his father and prince mershersky 
who was arguing eagerly, making forceful gestures. The topic was Speransky, news of whose unexpected banishment and reported treason had only just reached Moscow. Now, Prince Andrei was saying, the very men who a month ago were extolling him, and who are fully incapable of comprehending his aims, are criticizing him and condemning him. To criticize a man in disfavor is very easy, and so it is to make him responsible for the blunders of others. But I tell you, if any one has done any good during this present reign, it has been done by him, by him alone. He caught sight of Pierre and paused. A spasm passed over his face, and immediately his expression became stern. But posterity will do him justice, said he, and with that he turned to greet Pierre. Well, how are you? Stout as ever, he said in a lively tone, but the newly furrowed frown grew still deeper. Yes, I am well, he replied, in answer to Pierre's question, and laughed. Pierre saw clearly that this laugh was affected, and was simply equivalent to saying, Well, but who cares whether I am well or ill? After exchanging a few words with Pierre in regard to the frightful travelling from the Polish frontier, and how he met in Switzerland a number of men who had known Pierre, and about Mr. de Salle, whom he had brought abroad as his son's tutor, Prince Andrei again, with feverish eagerness, returned to the topic of Speransky, which the two old men still kept on the tapis. If there had been any treason, and if there had been any proofs of his correspondence with Napoleon, then they would surely have been published broadcast, said he, speaking excitedly and fluently. Personally, I do not like Speransky, and I have not liked him in the past, but I do like justice. Pierre was aware that his friend was now laboring under that necessity, which he himself had only too often experienced, of getting thoroughly stirred up and excited over some alien topic, simply for the purpose of dispelling thoughts too heavy to be endured. When Prince Mershersky had taken his departure, Prince Andrei took Pierre's arm and drew him into the room which had been prepared for his occupancy. In this room a bed had been hastily set up. Trunks and boxes, opened, were scattered about. Prince Andrei went to one of these and took out a casket, and from the casket a packet wrapped in a paper. All this he did silently and very swiftly. He straightened himself up and cleared his throat. His face was gloomy and his lips compressed. Forgive me if I trouble you. Pierre perceived that Prince Andrei was going to speak about Natasha, and his broad countenance expressed pity and sympathy. This expression on Pierre's face nettled Prince Andrei. He went on in a loud, decided, and disagreeable voice. I have received my dismissal from the Countess Rostova, and rumors have reached my ears of your brother-in-law having offered himself to her, or something to that effect. Is that true? Whether true or false, Pierre began, but Prince Andrei interrupted him. Here are her letters and her miniature. He took the packet from the table and handed them to Pierre. Give this to the Countess, if you happen to see her. She is very ill, said Pierre. So she is still here, inquired Prince Andrei. And Prince Kurgan, he asked hastily. He went some time ago. She almost died. I am very sorry for her illness, said Prince Andrei. He smiled coldly, evilly, disagreeably, like his father. But Mr. Kurgan did not, then, honor the Countess Rostova with the offer of his hand, asked Prince Andrei. He snorted several times. It is impossible for him to marry, for the reason that he is already married, said Pierre. Prince Andrei gave a disagreeable laugh, again suggestive of his father. And where, pray, is he to be found, this precious brother-in-law of yours, may I ask, said he. He has gone to Peter... However, I don't really know, said Pierre. Well, it's all the same to me, said Prince Andrei. Assure the Countess Rostova that she has been, and is, perfectly free, and that I wish her all happiness. Pierre took the package of letters. Prince Andrei, as though trying to make up his mind whether it were not necessary for him to say something, or expecting Pierre to say something, looked at him keenly. See here. Do you remember a discussion we had once in Petersburg? Do you remember? Yes, I remember, said Prince Andrei hurriedly. I said that a fallen woman ought to be forgiven. But I did not say that in my own case I should forgive her. I cannot. But wherein is the comparison? asked Pierre. Prince Andrei interrupted him. His voice was loud and shrill. Yes, ask her hand again. 
be magnanimous and all that. Yes, that would be very noble, but I am not capable of following in this gentleman's footsteps. If you wish to continue my friend, never mention this to me again, not a word about it. Now good-bye. You will give this to her, will you? Pierre left the room and went to the old prince and the princess Maria. The old prince seemed more animated than usual. The princess was her ordinary self, but back of her sympathy for her brother, Pierre could see that she was delighted at having the engagement broken. As Pierre looked at them, he realized how deep were the scorn and dislike which they all felt toward the Rostovs. He realized that it was wholly helpless even to mention her name, though she might have had anyone else in the world in Prince Andrei's place. At dinner the conversation turned on the war which was unquestionably imminent. Prince Andrei kept up an unceasing stream of talk and discussion with his father, or with Mr. de Saul, his son's Swiss tutor, and he displayed more excitement than usual, and Pierre knew only too well the moral cause of this excitement. End of chapter 21part five chapter twenty two of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter twenty two that same evening pierre went to call upon the rostovs to fulfil his commission natasha was in bed the count had gone to the club and pierre having entrusted the letters into sonya's hands went to marya dmitrievna who was greatly interested to know how prince andrei had received the news Ten minutes later, Sonya appeared. "'Natasha is determined to see Count Pyotr Kirillovitch,' said she. "'But how can he go to her room? Everything is in disorder there,' said Marya Dmitrievna. "'But she is dressed, and has come down into the drawing-room,' said Sonya. Marya Dmitrievna merely shrugged her shoulders. "'If only the Countess would come. This is a perfect torture to me. Now be careful, and don't tell her everything,' she added warningly. It would break my heart if anything were said to hurt her. She is so to be pitied, so to be pitied. Natasha, grown decidedly thin, with pale, smileless face, though not at all confused, as Pierre supposed she would be, stood in the middle of the drawing-room. When Pierre made his appearance in the door, she hesitated, evidently undecided whether to go to him or wait for him. Pierre hastened forward. He supposed that she would, as usual, give him her hand. But she stood motionless, sighing deeply, and with her arms hanging lifelessly, in exactly the same pose that she always took when she went in the middle of the music-room to sing, only with an entirely different expression. "'Pyotr Kirillovitch,' she began, speaking very swiftly, "'Prince Bolkonsky was your friend, and is still your friend,' she added by afterthought, for it seemed to her that everything was past, and all things had become new. He told me once to turn to you if— Pierre quietly blew his nose as he looked at her. Till that moment he had, in his heart, blamed her and tried to despise her, but now she seemed to him so eminently deserving of pity that there was no room in his heart for reproach. "'He is here now. Please ask him to for—forgive,' she paused— and breathed still faster, but she did not weep. "'Yes, I will tell him,' said Pierre. He knew not what to say. Natasha was evidently terrified by what Pierre might have thought she meant. "'Yes, I know that all is over between us,' she said, hurriedly. "'No, it can never be. All that tortures me is the wrong that I have done him. Only ask him to forgive. Forgive. Forgive me for all.' Her whole frame trembled, and she sat down in a chair. Never before had Pierre experienced such a feeling of compassion as now came over him. "'I will tell him. I will certainly tell him all,' said Pierre. "'But I should like to know one thing.' "'What?' asked Natasha. "'I should like to ask if you loved.' Pierre did not know what term to use in speaking of Anatole. "'Did you love that vile man?' "'Don't call him vile,' exclaimed Natasha. "'But I... I don't know. I don't know at all.' Then the tears came again. And a still more intense feeling of pity, affectionate compassion, and love came over Pierre. He was conscious of the tears welling out from under his spectacles and dropping, and he hoped that they would not be seen. 
Let us say no more about it, my dear, said Pierre. Strange indeed suddenly seemed to Natasha the sound of his voice, so sweet, so tender, so sincere. Let us say no more about it, my dear. I will tell him all, but one thing I want to ask you. Consider me your friend, and if you need any help or advice, or simply if you need someone in whom you can confide, not now, but by and by, when everything is clear to your own mind, remember me. He took her hand and kissed it. I should be happy if I were in the position to... Pierre grew confused. Do not speak to me so. I do not deserve it, cried Natasha, and she started to leave the room. But Pierre detained her by the hand. He knew that there was something more he must tell her, but when he had spoken it, he was amazed at his own words. Wait, wait. All life is before you, said he. Before me, before me is only ruin, she exclaimed, in the depths of shame and self-reproach. Ruin, he repeated. If I were not myself, but the handsomest, wisest, and best man in the world, and were free, I would this very instant, on my knees, sue for your hand and your love. Natasha, for the first time in many days, wept tears of gratitude and emotion, and, giving Pierre one look, she fled from the room. Pierre followed her, almost running, and restraining the tears of tenderness and happiness that choked him. Throwing his shuba over his shoulders, but without putting his arms through the sleeves, he went out and got into his sledge. "'Where now?' asked the driver. "'Where?' repeated Pierre to himself. "'Where can I go now? To the club, or to make some calls? All men at this moment seemed to him so contemptible, so mean, in comparison with that feeling of emotion and love which had overmastered him, in comparison with that softened glance of gratitude which she had given him just now through her tears. "'Home,' said Pierre, throwing back his bearskin shuba and exposing his broad, joyfully throbbing chest, though the mercury marked ten degrees of frost. It was cold and clear, above the dirty, half-lighted streets, above the black roofs of the houses, stretched the dark, starry heavens. Only as Pierre gazed at the heavens above, he ceased to feel the humiliating pettiness of everything earthly in comparison with the height to which his soul aspired. As he drove out on the Arbatskaya Square, the mighty expanse of the dark, starry night spread out before Pierre's eyes. Almost in the zenith of this sky, above the Prechentensky Boulevard, convoyed and surrounded on every side by stars, but distinguished from all the rest by its nearness to the earth, and by its white light, and by its long curling tail, stood the tremendous, brilliant comet of 1812, the same which men thought presaged all manner of woes and the end of the world. But in Pierre, this brilliant luminary, with its long train of light, awoke no terror. On the contrary, rapturously, his eyes wet with tears, he contemplated this glorious star which seemed to him to have come flying with inconceivable swiftness through measureless space, straight toward the earth, there to strike like an enormous arrow, and remain in that one fate designated spot upon the dark sky, and, pausing, raise aloft with monstrous face its curling tail, flashing and playing with white light, amid the countless other stars doomed to perish. It seemed to Pierre that this star was the complete reply to all that was in his soul flowing into new life and filled with tenderness and love. End of chapter 22 and end of part 5 Also this is the end of volume 2 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole.